Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. My name is James Cowell. I'm the COO and the campus president of Uncensored America at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I want to thank you guys so much for coming out. And in addition, if you guys want to get involved with us, I wanted to make you guys aware you can find anybody with a uh, volunteer tag or myself or Sean over there in the corner, and we can set you up with all the things you need. With that out of the way, I'll hand this over to Sean Semenko. Thank you, James. That was very nice. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad everybody came out. This is a great evening. We, if you don't know about us yet, we're a nonpartisan organization that's a free speech org. But where we differ from most free speech organizations is that we are trying to push back against cancel culture and censorship. And the most effective way to do that is to actually host people who are censored, canceled, or have dissenting opinions. So that's our main priority, but we'll host anybody, we'll talk to anybody, we'll have any debate with anyone at any time. So. We're trying to bring back a free speech culture to America. I mean, we do have the First Amendment, which is great, but if you've ever tweeted anything provocative or if you've had a controversial opinion, you know what it's like out there to get canceled or censored. You don't really have free speech in the practical sense. You do have it legally, but not really in a practical sense. So that's what we're gonna try and change. And we're fighting a good fight every day. We were just at Penn State uh, two weeks ago. I don't know if anybody saw about that, but it got a little crazy. And just being here right now is a victory for free speech, which might sound ridiculous, but if you saw anything that happened at Penn State, uh, you probably heard that Gavin McGinnis was going to speak there. There were a bunch of news articles written about it. There were protests planned, and it was going to be a big event. We had lots of people that were going to come out. But then event day came, and Penn State canceled the event, which, look, let's be real. The protesters wanted to shut down. They won. And that's terrible. That's awful that they were able to pull that off, that they were able to censor and cancel two speakers on campus. And like I said, hundreds came out. If you saw Alex Stein's Twitter or his YouTube, there was a girl that spit on him during the protest, and that's gone viral all across, all across the country. And he was on Tucker Carlson talking about it. So it was still a big deal, but unfortunately, there are people that will try to shut us down. There were a few protesters out there, but they didn't come anywhere close to this to try and shut us down. So thankfully, we're here, we're gonna have a debate, and we're gonna have a great time tonight. So with that said, uh, I think the moral of the story really is that we gotta keep fighting. There's a lot of challenging issues, a lot of challenging times ahead, and we just gotta keep fighting through it. I mean, even when they try to cancel you, even when they do successfully succeed in canceling you or shutting you down or writing an SPLC hit piece on you, you have to keep fighting, because if you don't, they win, and that's why we're here today, because we're gonna keep fighting. Uh, but if you'd wanna start a chapter of Uncensored America at your campus, if anybody's out of town, which I'm sure quite a few people from here are, go to uncensoredamerica.us, and we have a link right on the homepage where you can start a chapter on your campus. It's very simple and easy. I will help you out with that, and some of my officers will as well. But if you want to get more involved, like James said, you can talk to him afterwards or you can talk to me if you want to start a chapter or just check out our cool merch that you probably saw on the screen there or any of our stickers or anything that you like. Uh, you can all check that out there and follow us on social media as well. So now on to the debate that you're all here for. Both of these guys are political YouTubers that you've probably watched at some point in your internet history and you've had a great time enjoying them. But now I get to see them in person. We are going to be debating gender roles. Specifically, should America return to traditional gender roles? And in the affirmative, we will have the Christian conservative, who is the host of Heck Off Kami on YouTube. And in the negative, we will have a left-wing YouTuber who you may remember from a few years ago was actually a Republican hardcore conservative that is now a left-wing YouTuber. So, would everybody please welcome John Doyle, Hunter Avalon. Now, before we start, I just want to quick the debate rules for both you guys. We will be answering the question tonight, should America return to traditional gender roles? You'll each have a 10 minutes to give an open statement, but you guys agree that 
he would do a 15 one and you would do a five minute closing statement uh, at the end. So we will have two segments and a crossfire in between. The first segment, each debater will get five minutes each and then another round five minutes each. And then we'll go to the crossfire. Then we'll have a second segment where we'll have five minutes each again, another five minutes each to respond. And then we'll have 10 minutes of closing statements per debater. There'll be a 20 minute Q&A at the end. All questions are welcome and anything's uh, up for grabs. We will start a line right here and then that'll be everything. There are no prepared notes, but you can prepare your openings and you do have notepads that you can write anything you want on. So without further ado, John, let's kick things off. We are testing the audio. Can, is that a yes? Can, yeah. Very good. Well, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for coming out this evening, even those who came out in the, in the protest to protest against Hunter and myself, the two cis white men. You know, these are the real revolutionaries, right? It gets a little bit cold out, and all of a sudden fighting the fascists isn't so appealing. But these are the people who would have held Stalingrad, right? No, but Hunter and I, you know, we had a real uh, sort of venom and sandman moment behind, behind the stage. You know, I was like, look, you want to kill the SJWs. I want to kill the SJWs. Together, they don't stand a chance. Interesting. Okay, look, it's uncensored America, right? If you don't have like a playful death threat here and there, is it really free speech? <laughs> Probably not. But anyways, uh, this is the most professionally organized event that I've ever done, and I know that Hunter said the same as well backstage. So thank you to Uncensored of America for putting this on. Thank you, of course, to the security for putting this on. Can we get a round of applause for them for doing such a fantastic job? So the topic that we will be debating this evening is, of course, whether America should return to traditional gender roles. I believe that we absolutely should, and my opponent this evening disagrees. And so for the sake of intelligent discussion, I would hope that we can avoid the sort of sophomore characterizations of these traditional gender roles as oppressive and evil because they aren't. They're quite the opposite, actually. Contrary to the popular narratives, when America retained these roles, women were still working, they were involved in their communities, they enjoyed different hobbies and projects, they owned businesses, etc. But ultimately, both men and women understood that their ultimate purpose was to raise boys to be good men, good husbands, and good fathers, and to raise girls to be good women, good wives, and good mothers. Those who tend to sympathize with the views expressed by my opponent tend to regard those roles as not, on, not only harmful, but as socially constructed. Therefore, I believe that the crux of this debate this evening will be a difference of worldview, nature versus nurture, genetics versus environment, what our role is here on earth, etc. With traditional gender roles, gender stereotypes, I would simply recall the Supreme Court precedents on pornography. You know it when you see it. You know, we're all familiar with these. And the question is, where do they come from? Those who tend to sympathize with my opponent would believe that things like race, like nationality, childhood, madness, age, intelligence, beauty, that these things are all social constructs, gender roles included, that they only exist because for whatever reason we, typically white men, have decided that they should. This is, of course, not the case. Men and women are fundamentally different. Their behavior is different. Their temperament is different. And this is much more related to their biology than to their environment. Behavior is biological. Think about what gender role even means. Gender as a word containing the prefix gen, like genesis, generation, generate, meaning coming to be, followed by der, like dermatology, taxidermy, referring to skin, referring to flesh. So gender literally means your biological role in coming together and creating new flesh, creating life. Therefore, any gender role that you might have, by definition, would be your role in cultivating stable families and stable children, and by extension, stable societies. Our biological drives and instincts, whether you look at it from an evolutionary perspective or from a religious perspective, are oriented towards reproduction. And because of that, these gender roles and gender stereotypes are completely syndicated all throughout the world and all throughout history. With so much difference between all of these cultures and all of these time periods, it really makes you wonder why the only thing that they have in common besides these gender roles is human biology. Any honest preschool teacher or any honest parent can testify to the average differences between boys and girls. And in English, the word that we have to describe those who insist that there are no innate differences between the sexes is childless. This is your average feminist, of course, as we know. Uh, but let's experiment. You know, suppose that you were a visitor to a previously unknown society. You discover another continent or something. 
You gave the members of that society a test requiring them to identify the gender of a random person from that society described by a series of adjectives. One is described as sentimental, submissive, superstitious, affectionate, dreamy, sensitive, attractive, dependent, emotional, fearful, soft-hearted, and weak. The other is described as adventurous, dominant, forceful, independent, strong, aggressive, autocratic, daring, enterprising, robust, stern, active, courageous, progressive, meaning continuing, rude, severe, unemotional, and wise. What is the likelihood that the members of that society will identify the former gender as male and the latter as female? Well, a cross-cultural study of gender stereotypes conducted by John Williams and Deborah Best suggests that the answer, is, the answer is virtually zero. Respondents in at least 23 of the 25 countries studied uh, associated each of the first set of adjectives, each individual one, not just all cumulatively, um, with females and the second set with males. Moreover, since gender roles are inherently sexual in that that is what unites man and woman, Insight into the truth of these can be found through what each sex is attracted to in a mate. If these roles are socially conditioned, then it should make no difference, especially not throughout the world in cultures that don't have our level of Western enlightenment. But evolutionary psychologist David Buss studied mate preferences in 37 different cultures over five years, and he found that women's and men's ideal mates were stable and differed very little by culture. Whether women were from Iran or Vietnam or wherever else in the world, they valued material resource, social status, and ambition in men much more than physical appearance. And I bet you can guess what the men valued, which was them being young and physically attractive. Moreover, once the designers of the study knew what an anonymous person's preferences or ideals were in a mate, they could predict the sex of that person with 92% accuracy. Sounds to me like no matter where you are, women want confident providers and men want beautiful women. And we wonder why feminists are mad. So what is attractive in males and females is attractive because it implies how they will suit the role that we desire them for. Desirable traits in males imply the role of the provider and the protector, and desirable traits in women imply the role of the mother. If our society is to have a future, then it will require men and women to get together and have children. And if there are roles and behaviors that we are biologically predisposed to pursue, then it is better to pursue them than to fight reality and just be miserable. So those like my opponent will have to explain why Western social constructs actually have a greater impact in syndication on the world and can explain this better than simple biology and why this has been the case for virtually all of human history. Why has there never been a matriarchal society? Were all the men throughout the world just sending letters back and forth with notes on how to oppress women? No, male leadership is rooted in biology. But despite our universal awareness of these traits, we're told that they are stereotypes, which is to say it's bad to recognize patterns. Despite this, stereotype accuracy is actually one of the most replicable effects discovered in social psychology. Sure, stereotypes may be bad if we're all taught that people on like Mars are a certain way, which causes us to think inaccurately of them, but men and women interact with each other constantly for their entire lives. And the idea that the average person would ignore a lifetime of personal experience just to subconsciously uphold some sort of unfounded myth just simply defies belief. Most studies of stereotype accuracy have shown them to be accurate generalizations relying on probability rather than category, meaning acknowledging the existence of tendencies can coexist with acknowledging the existence of outliers. For example, there's an overwhelming empirical evidence uh, of sex differences in temperament. In a review of sex difference research, psychologist Alice Eagley found that existing research refutes four commonly asserted claims about sex differences, that they are small, inconsistent from study to study, artifactual, and inconsistent with stereotypes. Eagley notes that despite frequent repetition of such claims, it is not cultural stereotypes that have been shattered by contemporary psychological research, but rather the scientific consensus forged in the feminist movement in the 1970s. But maybe those differences do exist, but it's because of socialization and environmental conditioning. Okay, how can we test that? Presumably by looking at children, right, since the period during which they would have been socialized into believing these things would be the shortest. Well, from a young age, boys are far more competitive than girls. Even in preschool, they engage in more competitive activities than girls. Moreover, a, stud a study of second through 12th graders revealed that girls reported stronger attitudes about cooperation and weaker attitudes about competition in all grades than did boys. Janet Lever's famous study of how children play reflects this as well. Young boys are far more likely to engage in games, meaning play where there is specific competitive goals, while girls are far more likely to engage in play, things without explicit goals or competition like hopscotch, jump rope, etc. And even that competition is actually indirect because it's through turn taking instead of, you know, more explicit in the moment competition like boys engage in. And of course, domination and leadership are forms of competition as well. 
Dominance behaviors are those intended to achieve or maintain a position of high relative status, to obtain power, influence, resources, all the things that women want, etc. And studies have shown that when children get together, even in preschool years, dominance hierarchies emerge spontaneously. Some children are far more influential and less subject to aggression by others. Boys engage in a significantly greater amount of dominance play related um, than girls do, such as playing with weapons, engaging in rough and tumble play, uh, and then also in mixed sex groups in nursery schools, boys end up disproportionately at the top of the classroom hierarchy. This is very important because little boys and little girls are basically equal at that age physically. So if male dominance throughout world history is only due to this later developed strength, you'd expect there to be a delay in these behaviors, but there aren't. It's instinctual. Even among mixed group of 33-year-old toddlers, girls are far more likely to listen to instructions from boys than vice versa. Male leadership is just natural. The historical record is perfectly clear. Men have generally achieved status through dominance of other men, and women have generally achieved status through their associations with high status men, sometimes even by competing with women for them. Not surprisingly, in same-sex pairings, a high dominance individual will assume a leadership position over a low dominance individual. However, when a high dominance woman is paired with a low dominance man, the man actually tends to assume the leadership role, but it's not because he asserted dominance over the woman, but rather because the woman selected him to be the leader. Conversely, females in all known societies exhibit more nurturing behavior than males both inside and outside of the family. Everywhere, it is women who are the primary caretakers of the young, the sick, and the old. Psychological studies tend to confirm that women are more empathetic than men, regardless of age or the measures used, which which is, of course, substantially correlated uh, with nurturing behavior. And females of all ages tend to be person-oriented, while males tend to be object-oriented. Uh, as early as their first year of life, even, girls pay more attention to people, and boys pay more attention to inanimate objects. When shown identical photographs, males have a greater tendency to report seeing objects, while females do with seeing different people. Differences in orientation affect the way that people perceive themselves. Women's self-identity and self-esteem tend, uh, tend to be centered around sensitivity and their relations to others, while a man's self-concept tends to be centered around task performance performance, independence, dominance, things of that nature. And one study showed that 50% of women, but only 15% of men, agreed with the statement when I can succeed at something that will also make other people happy. This provides insight into the differences between male and female depression. And females, on average, outperform males on language skills right out of the womb. They typically start speaking earlier and advance to whole sentences sooner than baby boys. Males do catch up, but much later, and throughout their school years, girls score higher on average than boys do in both reading and writing. Conversely, the ratio of boys who score over 700 out of 800 on the math section of their SAT is 13 to 1. Certainly, each culture may have their unique quirks and eccentricities for how males and females behave, but the fundamentals are obviously biological. PET and fMRI scans have allowed us to view how the male and female brains activate in certain areas when solving problems and responding to stimuli. Males have two and a half times the brain space devoted to sex drive and larger areas devoted to aggression and action. Action. The corpus callosum, which links the left side of the brain to the right side, is thicker in women, meaning it's better able to pass messages from one part to the other, which is shown to grant an advantage in things like verbal fluency. As much as progressives want to pretend that there are no differences between men and women, there's simply no respectable argument for that anymore. Science is settled, if you will. A number of medical studies have even shown that female-to-male organ transplants are more likely to fail than male-to-male -male organ transplants, even when controlling for body size. The bottom line, as articulated by Dr. Margaret McCarthy, is that sex is a biological variable that profoundly influences the physiology of every organ in the body. And of course, the brain is an organ. Sure, there's variance. Sure, Women with higher levels of testosterone are more, like, are more likely to be unfaithful spouses. They're more likely to have stronger handshakes. They're more or less likely to smile in photographs. There's always interesting little quirks. But any neurologist would be able to correctly identify those brains as females because the differences are that significant. Therefore, if my opponent is to win the debate, he will have to prove that gender roles in themselves do not exist at all beyond arbitrary and perhaps oppressive social constructs and explain why that's been the case for virtually all of history. Gender roles, of course, only being relevant to this, the discussion because of failed predictions about, well, if we stop oppressing them, it'll be equal. And then, well, if we stop discriminating against them, it'll be equal. And now, finally, the blame is on these internalized attitudes about gender and socially constructed things that can't be proven. Then that'll finally be equal. Why is it that the profile, though, of the most depressed person in America 
is also the profile of she who we're told is the greatest beneficiary of these programs, the single, middle-aged, childless working woman. Why do primates, primates display early sex differences in behavior? Is this also socially constructed? Young male monkeys have been found to prefer dump trucks and other vehicles as opposed to plush dolls, whereas the young female monkeys prefer the plush dolls. Are they behaving differently because we expect them to? If so, why doesn't this translate to our expectations of them throwing feces at each other? With the academic censorship and cultural programming, you would expect the male-female gaps to close if it were really about environment, but they haven't. So the question is, should America return to traditional gender roles? It's not as simple as door A versus door B. It's actually about rather consciously choosing to continue to swim upstream away from our nature. And given that we know the answer to this is yes, the gender roles are biological, the more interesting question is, how has this messaging created a culture that is better for men and women than the one that we had prior? It's created broken homes, broken children, isolation, nihilism, and despondency. What have we gained in, uh, in return for this grand social experiment, and why should it continue? If we had the option to return economically and socially, we would. Pew, uh, Pew Research shows that am among married mothers, 76% of them say that their ideal work situation would be either no work or just part-time work. Include into that single mothers, that figure still remains at 67%. Moreover, Pew Research, when researching the trade-offs between work and family time, found that married mothers who had, quote, made sacrifices for their family were the happiest. We've also learned that homemakers are more likely to report being very satisfied with the work they do in comparison to those who pursue paid employment. When women have the option, this is what they want. If Hunter is correct, you would expect to see happier men and happier women, but you see the opposite. You see widespread despair, mental illness, and suicide. Rejecting gender roles is a form of narcissism. It says, I am better than my biology. I'm living for me. And not coincidentally, research published in 2009 by psychologist Jen Twenge used data collected from some 16,000 college students and found a sharp rise in scores on a narcissism narcissism index personality test, of course, disproportionately affecting young women since the 1950s. But anytime egalitarianism is brought up, it's framed as both possible and desirable. There's literally no metric to suggest that these things have been good for us other than the fact that they have happened. Why is this good? Because we have it now. Why is it good to have equality? Because it's equal. Who cares? If history has been so terrible and patriarchal, then how did we build the society? And why have the last few decades of experimenting with my opponent's ideas about gender been so disastrous for men and women? Are we really supposed to believe that without these oppressive gender roles, we would have something like Wakanda? And if so, why have we declined so rapidly since the onset of these attitudes a few decades ago? When does the utopia kick in? A social construction is not by definition at odds with nature. It emerges from our nature and serves human needs. Boys must be guided into manhood, much differently than girls who must be guided into womanhood. This is how we build society. The most happy people in America are married men and married women. Statistically, married couples are much healthier, wealthier, less prone to suicide, less prone to abuse drugs and alcohol, less likely to be employed, more likely to have a broad network of friends and relatives, all more than single Time's and divorced up. people. <laughs> this is a fact. Attacking the institution of marriage through gender roles is terrorism, and we will not stand for it. Hunter? <laughs> All right, well, first and foremost, thank you very much to Uncensored America for censoring this, or for censoring this event, <laughs> for sponsoring this event. No censorship here. Uh, one complaint, though, you guys did mess up with bringing me my soy milk, but it's okay. I'll, I, I can forgive you, but uh, yeah, so today the question is, should America return to traditional gender roles? Now, gender roles are a collection of behaviors that we expect men and women to adhere to in order to be the ideal man or woman. Although gender roles have changed and adapted throughout history, some roles have outlived others. This includes women being polite, accommodating, nurturing, and men being aggressive, stoic, and dominant. These are considered more traditional gender roles. And just to be clear, gender roles by themselves are not always bad, but the enforcement of them almost always is. Obviously, gender roles aren't enforced by law, but they are enforced socially. This includes stigma around men who show their emotions and stay at home with the kids, and shaming women who enter the workforce or prioritize career instead of starting a family. Traditionalists will often claim that women are naturally more nurturing and men are naturally protective providers. This is almost always followed by fantasizing about 1950s America, the supposed golden era where the nuclear family was promoted, traditional gender roles were heavily encouraged, and women knew their place. 
It's true that the 1950s saw the highest rate of happiness among Americans yet. That is true. However, this wasn't due to traditional gender roles. In fact, something the traditionalists don't talk about very often is that although the nuclear family was heavily advertised, the 1950s actually saw traditional gender roles being challenged in many ways, particularly for women. After World War II, women made up a third of the workforce, entering the workforce at unprecedented rates during the war. Although traditional values were still heavily encouraged and women had fewer rights compared to men, many women challenged these roles and stayed content working jobs that were usually perceived as more masculine. Many traditionalists will also point to the 50s and 60s as an example of a time when marriage lasted and divorce was hardly an option. Again, it's true that the 50s saw an all-time high when it came to marriage rates, but you have to ask yourself, at what cost? Because this time also included less autonomy for women, divorce was rare, but spousal abuse was common, with domestic abuse not even being considered a legal matter, but a family issue. That's right, domestic abuse was not a legal matter, law enforcement didn't even get involved most of the time, and domestic abuse wasn't formally criminalized nationally until 1994. Now, thankfully, we've come a long way, and gender roles have certainly become looser, but these traditional gender roles are still encouraged in many ways, particularly when it comes to the modern nuclear family. Women are still generally seen as the caretakers, and men are usually expected to be the breadwinner. This arrangement works well for millions of couples in America. I have no problem with a stay-at-home mom and a working father. The problem arises again when these roles are enforced by shaming those who deviate from these gender expectations. The father absolutely should provide for his family, but what is provision? Provision is not limited to financial provision. If a father is better equipped to stay at home with the kids and the mother is better suited to be the breadwinner, why is this a problem? They should both be providing. Even if this kind of arrangement works better for some family units, stay-at-home dads still face shaming and stigma surrounding their masculinity. A 2013 Pew Research Center survey found that while 51% of Americans think a child is better off with a mother at home than in the workplace, only 8% say the child would be better off with a stay-at-home father. Furthermore, even if women are naturally better caretakers, the attempt at enforcing this role only results in negative outcomes. Research has actually shown that female caregivers experience greater role strain, which means that they face more pressure to conform to caregiving positions. An analysis by Bowling Green State University found that female caregivers generally report having more negative experiences than male caregivers. And according to a 2012 Gallup poll of more than 60,000 stay-at-home moms, they found these women were more likely to report anger, sadness, and depression compared to their employed counterparts. Now, of course, if being a stay-at-home mom is what the woman wants, I would expect her to be happy in that role. But enforcing it via expectations and stigma pushes people into boxes that they might not fit in. Even more so, the attempt to enforce traditional gender roles actually harms a huge goal of traditionalists, which is strong and healthy family units. In 2013, the University of Chicago uh, published a paper that looked at 4,000 married couples in America, and it found that once a woman started to earn more than her husband, divorce rates increased. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, doesn't this prove then that men should be the primary earners? No, actually. It proves that these rigid gender roles largely need to be done away with. The reason a female breadwinner increases the likelihood of divorce is largely because men feel emasculated for not living up to these arbitrary expectations placed on men. The study also found that even when the woman earns more, she still does more housework as well. The authors of the study said that a threatening wife will take on a greater share of housework so to comfort the husband's unease with the situation. If the woman is successful and is able to learn or able to earn more, excuse me, this shouldn't cause end, uh, this shouldn't cause unease. The end goal should be a happy, healthy, stable family unit. 
Even more so, according to a study published in Sage Journals, using data for married and cohabitating heterosexual couples in 29 countries from 2004 to 2014, their results provide robust evidence that male breadwinner norms are a key driver of the association between men's unemployment and risk of separation. An increase of one standard deviation in male breadwinner norms increases the odds of separation uh, with men's unemployment by 32%. Unfortunately, when we shame men for not being the breadwinner, it destabilizes marriages and hurts the end goal of traditionalism. Because men feel pressure that they must be the breadwinner in order to be the ideal man, job loss can lead to lower confidence and a higher likelihood that the marriage will end. Attempting to enforce gender roles hurts marriages in other ways as well. Studies have already suggest, or studies have already suggested that strict adherence to these rigid traditional gender roles, you're messing me up, Sean. Studies have already suggested that strict adherence to these rigid traditional gender roles can increase the likelihood that the man will act out in violence against his partner. But that's not all. A 2014 study assessed the effect of masculine discrepancy stress, which is a form of distress arising from perceived failure to conform to socially prescribed masculine gender role norms on intimate partner violence. Results indicated that masculine discrepancy stress significantly predicted men's historical perpetuation of intimate partner violence. Abuse of any kind is one of the leading causes of divorce. The more you shame men for failing to live up to your preferred gender roles, the more likely it is that that man will harm his marriage and destroy, or excuse me, harm his partner and destroy his marriage, and none of that is very traditional. Gendered expectations that men should be stoic, viewing emotions as a sign of weakness, is, incredib uh, is incredibly detrimental to men's own mental well-being. There have been many times throughout history when crying was specifically perceived as masculine, but that's far from the case nowadays. Unfortunately, this expectation uh, leads to repressive coping styles and an increased likelihood of suicide. Now, I'm not sure how you could live a traditional life or raise a traditional family if you're dead. Today in the US, men are significantly more likely to die by suicide than women. Perhaps by acknowledging how enforcing these roles on men negatively affects them, society can help to alleviate this devastating reality. If gender roles work in your own relationship, that's cool. But don't try and force these roles on others to appease your own desire for a traditional aesthetic. Marriage has been proven to lead to higher rates of happiness and a longer lifespan. If you value marriage, recognize how these gender roles can impact the family unit, and it's crucial for a happier future. In fact, according to research published by Brigham Young University, couples with an equal partnership report more stability in their marriage, less conflict, less dependency, and less resentment. The expectation that men should be the breadwinner winner, and women is uh, naturally better off with the children can also have negative effects even on the children. How often have we heard people complain about how men rarely receive custody of the children? Maybe this is because we consistently reinforce this idea that women are just always naturally the better caretakers. Again, the idea that you should be strong, caring, and provide for your family are good values to have, but they don't apply to men or women. These values should be universal, divorced from gender entirely, and decided upon based on whomever is better equipped for that role within the marriage. So to summarize, enforcing gender roles can have devastating effects on marriages. It can contribute to higher rates of violence against women. It forces people to conform at the expense of their own well-being. It ignores the potentially caring fathers who deserve custody over their children. And it contributes to higher rates of suicide. Time's none up. Of, none of that is traditional. All right. We're going to move on to our first segment. <laughs> We have our first segment where we'll be rotating from John Hunter. Each will have five minutes, and then we'll do another round. We each have five minutes before we do the crossfire. So, John, you have five minutes. Uh, well, the first thing I'd like to address is sort of the overarching theme of his opening statement there, which is this idea that gender roles may exist in whatever capacity. They evolve over time, but they definitely shouldn't be enforced. I agree with this. No one's saying that gender roles should be enforced, but what's interesting is that while they may evolve over time, certain men in certain societies might dress a certain way, other men might cry before a, a knighting ceremony or something like that, ultimately, the biological roots of how men and women behave 
are one-to-one -one all throughout history and all throughout different societies. Moreover, who is enforcing them? Where is like the, the gender role Stasi going door to door and being like, are you barefoot, naked, pregnant in the kitchen or whatever? This is just simply not happening. In fact, it's actually being enforced in the opposite direction through, frankly, institutional soft power. I mean, look at where you see in the media. The messaging is always anti-traditional. It's always, why women who, well, well, frankly, white women, why white women need to stop having kids? Why white people need to have stop having kids right now? It is all anti-natalist propaganda. He did also make an interesting point there that I think is true, uh, which is that it is more difficult now to get married. This isn't necessarily because tradition in itself has failed, but because of things like economic structures, uh, offshoring a manufacturing base. It is true that what we had in the 1950s is not what we have now, and that is a problem. So this is sort of an abstract discussion um, in that regard. Another thing that he mentioned there was less autonomy for women. I would be curious to see how that's defined. What does that even mean? Like, yeah, if you are legally enshrined via some document that you are married to this man, sure, there's going to be a little bit of limitations on that behavior, but I would be curious to see why that's inherently bad. Also, domestic abuse. Careful. Who defines that? I mean, there is often a lot of embellishing that goes on in these cases. Obviously, no one here is for domestic abuse, uh, but I would be curious to see what that would act was actually looking like back then, because you can look at it from what was legally allowed and what was legally not allowed. But in terms of the actual instances of it occurring, you often hear this leftist trope of like, oh, women in the 50s were getting abused, and it's like, oh, okay. Hey, Grandma, is that true? Oh, no, sweetie, that's not. It's just like all this manufactured historical revisionism. Also. The decline in marriage through the 50s, it is true that the 50s were kind of the peak, but the decline began much further than that, right? I mean, through things like no-fault divorce, normalization of the sexual revolution, things like that. That's why marriage has declined, and it is good, and it does make people happier. And actually, you can look at studies that have surveyed 1,500 couples, or another one that's uh, surveyed 40,000 people, and they find that couples in more traditional marriages read less egalitarian marriages are actually happier and stay together longer. Um, in terms of women earning more, leading to divorce, Divorce, uh, well, if you look at who's initiating the divorce, it's like 80% women, so I don't think it's exactly the man just being emasculated. I think it's more of what maybe the uh, more incel types in the crowd would recognize as hypergamy. Women, regardless of their income, want men who earn more than they do. All across the world, all throughout time, they are attracted to resource and status. I mean, this is just the way that these things go. Um, in terms of why do they still do housework, it's not because they're trying to coddle their stupid husband. It's if you look at the way that men and women solve problems, men solve problems by looking at it and reducing it to its most competential forms and kind of solving it from there. Women tend to be much more meticulous. For those of us married, you might recall a situation where you were assigned to do a chore and you did it because you're not like this character of like, no, I'm the man, you did it. And your wife comes by and she's like, no, yeah, let me do it. You didn't do it right. That's just the way that these things go. So yeah, they're still doing the house work, but I don't think it's because they're like trying to help out their like poor husband. I'd be curious to see the sort of psychoanalysis uh, on this too. Is Hunter a stay-at-home dad? Is he insecure in that role? Who knows? But maybe you just feel like you failed as a man. Well, maybe that is what it is. You failed as a man. There's something going on within you that feels like you failed to provide. Maybe that's not socially constructed. Maybe that's just a reality. Like, it's not like this situation where, oh, I feel like I should be LARPing the 1950s, but I can't afford a Bel Air. What? I'm just distraught. Maybe it's like the most fundamental components of who you are as a man is actually being challenged by your inability to provide. I think that's very important to consider. Also, why is it bad? Why is it bad that you know men might be earning more, women might be earning less? I fail to see how that's bad. And of course, he did neglect to address all of the biological components that I was certain to mention in my introduction. Very important stuff. Um, he also brought up the suicide rates, male suicide because of these harmful gender stereotypes. When they were at their peak in the 1950s, let's say, you know, what are you, some kind of fairy? Kids weren't killing themselves at the rate they are now. Men weren't killing themselves at the rate they are now. So when gender roles were the most strict, the suicide rates and the depression rates in both genders were not what they are now. So I fail to see how that computes. Um, equal partnership is another thing he brought up. I would be curious to see how they define that. A lot of married couples I know who are more traditional consider themselves equal in the sense that the man provides, the woman takes care of the other things. Um, and you know, with the divorce court thing, I think it's also fair to say uh, they tend to frame men as abusers more than they frame women as like nurturers. You're not going to have like some liberal judge who's like, oh, the women are just so good at nurturing, it's going to be like, men are evil. So, yes. Some of this is from John, your opening here. So, um, 
You seem to be really set on this biological difference here, and uh, I, I don't know if maybe some other blue-haired lefties have like a weirder position, but obviously biology is real. Yes, of course. And uh, you even talk about how men and women have brain differences, and uh, even some of that is true. However, I think you left out something very important, which is that brains are malleable. They are like plastic. You can talk to scientists about this. And so social uh, uh, norms, uh, essentially, have the potential to change how your brain operates. So that could also play a role in why you see differences in male and female brains. But again, biology is real. I'm not denying that. Again, the problem comes when you are trying to enforce these gender roles on other people. And I don't know why you would say you're not trying to enforce them when you are literally advocating to bring America back to traditional gender roles. I don't know how you do that unless you're planning on enforcing it to a degree. And then you even go further and say, well, who's enforcing them? And then you proceed to try and get a diss at me for possibly being a stay-at-home dad. John, you're the one doing it, buddy. You're the one going door-to-door -door making sure that the women are pregnant and naked in the kitchen. <laughs> and you talk about no-fault divorce. That's another one I hear a lot about. Um, I think people fail to understand that no-fault divorce largely means that you don't need to prove to a divorce court why you are getting a divorce, which, let's be real, how does somebody prove that they're being emotionally abused? How does somebody prove that? That cannot always be proven in a court. So no-fault divorce, it goes both ways. I don't know really what relevance that has. You bring up the study about how women seem to be happier or they report happier marriages when they have more traditional gender roles. Now, the study you're talking about actually classified that as benevolent sexism. And what that means is that the man uh, tend to treat the women as uh, he, he would adore her and he would be more protective of her. Again, nothing really wrong with that. I don't even know why they would call it benevolent sexism, to be honest. However, if you look at the actual study, you'll see the reason that they were happier, the reason men and women were happier, at least, were different. Women specifically were happier because since the man was giving her more adoration and acting more protective, she actually perceived the marriage as being more egalitarian, and that was the reason why she was happier. You can read the study. I would dare any of you to do that. Now, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, let's see. You talk about how things have gotten worse now. You bring up broken homes. Again, I've already explained how enforcing traditional gender roles can actually contribute to broken homes, so I don't know why you would want to keep doing that if you care about broken homes. You talk about widespread despair. That is true. People are becoming less happy. Again, you can't just point to people being unhappy and then just attribute it to any issue you want. The reason why people are less happy nowadays is because uh, economic differences, and more specifically, people have less friends. People are not friends with their neighbors the same way that they used to be. And as funny as that might sound, that is a large reason as to why the happiness rates are decreasing here in America. You also talk about the increase of narcissism. Again, you can look and see why it's largely because of social media use. That brings out narcissism and has even been shown to have a correlation with uh, narcissistic behavior. So to just point to a time where people are unhappy and then attribute it to anything, I mean, that's not fair. I could say, well, a lot of people right now are unhappy, and John, you have a lot of subscribers, so clearly you're the reason why everybody's unhappy, you know? Like, that's, everybody I think can recognize that that's not a very reasonable or logical way to, uh, to, to assess these issues. And then, last but not least, you talk about gender roles being a social construct. Again, biology can exist. Gender roles, as far as the expectations that we expect from certain people, those can be, and largely are, socially constructed. There's a reason why biology, or excuse me, gender roles have changed. And Doyle, you point to a lot of uh, uh, similarities between history and how there were some similarities there, but I feel like you've also left out some major differences. For example, this is a pretty funny one, but small penises used to be a sign of masculinity. There's a reason why these ancient statues all depict men with did my mic die? Okay. Depict men with these tiny little penises. And it's because at the time, having a large penis was seen as barbaric and ridiculous and the antithesis of masculinity. So I think that it's really important to dig into the nitty gritty there, the nuance. Uh, I didn't get to hit on everything, but I feel like I was able to address some of the main points you made there. John, you have five minutes to respond. No problem. 
Um, so he acknowledged correctly that biology is real. Real. Uh, neuroplasticity is also something that is real. If you're familiar with the dissertation, you know that the effects of this are real. The thing is, though, neuroplasticity, socialization, whatever you'd like to call it, you can best isolate with babies and with young children, like we did so conveniently in my introduction. And if that were the case, that neuroplasticity, you know, brains can be molded, you'd expect to see like maybe 50 50. 40, 60 in terms of like where the babies are landing on the gender role spectrum. It's one to one. It's 100% of the time. Also, in terms of how enforcing it, are we really supposed to believe that Hunter Avalon gives a damn what I think about anything? That me making a little quip about a stay at home dad is somehow making stay at home dads insecure in the role? Absolutely not. But in terms of how it's being enforced, it's not so much enforcing it, it's simply removing the barriers. It is simply removing the propaganda that is telling young men and young women that the best thing they can do is pursue a career and not get married and hook up culture and women wanting children is like outdated and cringe and it's actually empowering to be a sentient fleshlight. That type of influence does get in people's brains. And so you can actually poll young people and what you'll find is that many of them still report wanting to get married and wanting to have kids, be, uh, believing that you know males and females are completely equal in the sense that they are the same. But then they'll also say, well, uh, you know, of course I'm a fan, of course I believe these things. So they are much less likely to want to say things that are socially unacceptable, but they still believe in their brains that they want to pursue things that would be regarded as more traditional. Also, benevolent sexism, call it what you want. Like, yeah, that sounds like pretty good to me. I don't know. It's like, oh, well, you're saying that the males and the females in the relationship were happy. Well, they were happy for different reasons because they're men and women. Yes, obviously. And also like, well, the woman actually, she's getting one up on you because she perceives it differently. She thinks it's actually equal. Who cares? Let her think what she wants. You know, like, okay, do your thing. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have an effect on the relationship. Everybody's happy. Everything's fine. He is correct about the less friends, uh, the relationships in general being in decline. It is true. This is symptomatic of industrial society, of technology, of things like that. And of course, these are problems and they have caused, you know, relationships to degrade. I am simply trying to remove the influence of the people who are purposefully trying from the top down to psy up young men and women into pursuing a life of hedonism as opposed to a life that is more meaningful through the creation of a family. In terms of suicide, depression, things like that, as mentioned in my intro, males and females experience depression much differently. Men are more likely to feel depressed if they feel like they have failed in their role. Females are more likely to feel depressed if they sort of are off-put by the environment. You can also see this in their suicide rates, for example. Men are more likely to successfully commit suicide. Women are more likely to sec uh, succeed successfully attempt suicide. I'm sure we can see the picture. A male is in a position and he's like, yeah, there's no way out of this. Shock under the head. A woman might be having an emotional episode and you know, just kind of does something and he goes to the hospital, everything's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is just the case. So in terms of like what we expect from our partners being socially constructed, it's the same throughout cultures. Every single culture wanted the status, wanted the youth, wanted the beautiful young woman. That is the same. In terms of the little differences, oh, you know, this guy wanted it. It's like, okay, find me a big difference. Find me a culture that was like, actually, women are running the show. Actually, women are exclusively the providers, exclusively not the nurturers. There's literally not one society that does this. Also, the small penis thing, Look, we've all been in high school, we've all doodled or whatever. Men just, you know, that's what we do. We plant the flag. And I think that it's probably more likely that the artists who were sculpting those sculptures knew that if they made a more accurate depiction of the male appendage, that would be all that people looked at. So I think it's actually historic, uh, historically accurate to say that the reason they did that was to distract, uh, or sorry, to remove the distraction from the appendage and focus more on the beauty of the rest of the statue. And also, I would urge you, my new friend, I don't think that arguing that having a small penis is actually very masculine is going to give you the look that you would like it to. <laughs> You have five minutes, Hunter. Is this working? Okay. First of all, I was arguing the small penis thing on your behalf, actually. So you know, <laughs> but no. All kidding aside, um, you, you're just wrong about the the small penis thing. Okay, we should focus on that a little bit more. <laughs> but no. But seriously, these. First of all, I'm not arguing that having a small penis nowadays is masculine. I'm He's arguing. Still fixated that, on it. <laughs> come on, we're all adults here, guys. Let's go. I'm arguing that at one point that was considered masculine. And no, it wasn't just because they were worried that people wouldn't pay attention to the other sculpture. You can read about this from historians. Ancient Greece specifically sculpted men with small penises because that was considered the, uh, um, the, the highest degree of what they would consider then male beauty. You ask for an example of when women ran the show. Again, I think that you're a little confused here. 
biology is real. For a long, long time, men have ran the show, and that is largely because they have testosterone. They are stronger, yes. When, there, when we were back in the cavemen days, or the days in which you needed to be out doing physical labor consistently, then yes, men were obviously going to do better there. They have testosterone. Again, I am not denying that there are biological differences between males and females. What I'm saying is that just because at one point men were the providers due to testosterone does not mean that nowadays, since testosterone is not nearly as important for providing, considering a lot of labor jobs have significantly decreased, that shouldn't be an expectation that we force on men or stigmatize them if they just don't adhere to that. You also bring up the baby boys. Baby boys are more emotionally reactive than baby girls. I don't know if you're aware of that, John, but that is a fact of the matter, that baby boys react to more emotion, they express more emotion, but it's once they get older that that starts to decrease. And they've done studies with communication styles of mothers, and they found that the mother would be very receptive and cool and chill when the daughter was being very emotionally expressive, but not so much with the boys. And it's not surprising that by the time they were six years old, boys had less emotional intelligence. A lot of that is, again, because of socialization. You ask why I care what your opinion is. You say, do I honestly think that uh, anybody is going to, or, or why I would care about what you say. But then you go on to say that hookup culture gets in people's brains. If hookup culture and these other ideals can subconsciously get in people's minds, I don't know why your ideas couldn't, unless you're really willing to bite that bullet. I guess you're really just that insignificant if you want to go that way. But again, a lot of these issues can be attributed to expectation. It's not that there are no differences between males and females. It's that expecting males and females to act a certain way solely because they might be biologically predisposed to this behavior does more harm than good. It destroys families. It negatively impacts children. It negatively impacts men. Let's see, let me go over one more here. Even further, when you talk about um, how we should kind of go the direction of our biology, we're not a slave to biology, not at all. Part of the reason that humans have become so advanced is because we recognize biological urges and desires that are not always right. That's how humans got to where they are today. Even more so, again, if a woman wants to be a caregiver or wants to be more nurturing with the family, that is by all means A-OK -okay with me. But when you force it, why is it that women report more negative feelings when they are in these roles? Why is it that women report more depression when they are stay-at-home moms? This doesn't mean being a stay-at-home mom is bad. It doesn't mean it's bad for women to be nurturing. It means that it's more likely to result in negative outcomes when you try and enforce it on people. So I say, let's be real Americans and just let people live their lives freely so long as it's not hurting other people. Cope. Oh. John. <laughs> Okay, you guys will have a 15-minute crossfire. You can go at it however you want. Just 15 minutes, free for all. Would you mind? Are you a little bit concerned that a lot of the evidence suggests that when you try to enforce these ideals, it results in negative outcomes? Do you feel like you're worsening the outcomes for a lot of people for the sake of an aesthetic of traditionalism? No, no, it's not about, look, I understand my intro is actually sort of self-referential in this regard, like the 1950s thing. That's sort of a parody insofar as a lot of more progressive types would tend to associate my beliefs with like this, you know, fetishizing of the 1950s. That's not really my belief, so it is sort of a parody. Wait, um, your opening wasn't your belief? I'm not, I'm not actually Are you walking a, back on your opening or? I'm not actually thinking that we're going to go back to the 1950s or something like that. I simply want stable marriages and stable families. Um, so do if I. you don't mind, I have a couple things I wanted to address here, and then maybe we can get a back and forth going. Well, hold on. We're still in the um, back and forth right now. Okay. So, no, I'm not going to go off that. If you care about stable marriages and stable families, why then are you advocating for the enforcement of these roles, which can be detrimental to stable families? And again, who is doing the enforcing? I mean, your side controls virtually all of the messaging in this country. Every institution is promoting your message. I am the dissenting voice, which is why it's not actually a fair opinion to say, well, hookup culture might get in people's brains and compel them to make poor decisions, but John Doyle's over here speaking to an audience of a couple hundred people, and he's actually going to be the one controlling the It's not the just youth. you. No, I think that it's not just you. It's like what I said in my beginning, is that it's not not enforced by law or even by institutions. So who's doing the enforcement? Hold on. It is socially enforced. By who? There are, 
all of society in many different ways. Society. There are expectations. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. We live in a society, okay? Joker. But yes, there are social expectations. You heard the research I read from Pew Research. There are far more expectations that women adhere to more of these traditional roles. And when men are stay-at-home fathers, for example, that's not seen as as acceptable. Why? I don't think that's absolutely the case. I mean, with your stay-at-home father example, I get that it's a touchy subject, so we will move on from that. But I'm not a stay-at-home dad, John, of if that who helps. who is enforcing all of these you know, gender roles, it doesn't happen. I'm young enough, you're young enough to remember having gone through the public education system, having gone through the cycle of programming to which we were exposed. There was never at any point this like, girls have to be these like handmaid's tale slaves and they have no, to stay you're, at you're home. No, do, you're, exactly, you're doing the thing where you straw man and make it seem like it nobody's exactly saying you must not opposite. cry or you are a little bitch. Nobody's saying this. It is exactly Now, first of all, I recognize that you want to keep going back to the stay-at-home dad thing because it probably bothers you that I have a wife and two children and I'm living the trad life, you're living the mad life, I get it. But even more so, I, I, I'm, when I'm talking about these social expectations, they are subtle, John. They're not these uh, in-your-face telling people that they must agree or must believe this way. They've done studies, for example, where they have asked middle schoolers, draw a picture of a scientist. Virtually everyone in that study draws a picture of a man. There's a reason why these sciences, for example, are perceived as a more masculine career. That is social conditioning, which we can change. Um, the reason that they draw a scientist as a man is something like 90% of scientists are men or something. The Why? Same reason, the Why same is reason, that? Thank you for proving my point. Yes. Because males excel in the higher levels of things like the hard sciences and things like, I mean, even as I read in the intro, the ratio is 13 to 1. Boys that score over 700 on the math section of their SATs compared to women, it's 13 to 1. That is biological. The same way that women are more likely to pursue things like early education, things like nursing, than are men. That is biological. Also, I, I just can't believe the, you're telling me the decisions people make are just biological as if it's 100%. not a super complicated hold on 100%. as if there's not a super complicated and nuanced thing that goes on between yes some biology but also social we are all a result of our biology sure. interacting with society. The social the decisions we made are not just purely biological. Of the scientist, the scientist can't be found in nature. That is a social construct. The uh, construction, the mechanisms in our brain making us want to go towards those things are biological. Those are innate. Also, the quip about you being married and me not. You'll have to refer me to which Norman Rockwell painting depicted you knocking up a woman, walking away, hooking up with another woman, and then going back to her once she was pregnant. I don't think that's very traditional. I will say that I will tell you. Now, it's you. very cute that you have like this tabloid understanding of what happened. Maybe if you've been reading up on some celebrity news, but virtually none of that was true, what you Wrong. just said. But even Wrong. more so, well, I know it's easier for you to derail into ad homs when you're obviously getting demonstrated to be completely wrong here. So men going into sciences is largely because it's expected to be a masculine and male career. Why? Wait, hold on. Women have made massive contributions to the sciences, even in a time when women were not expected to or were even actively discouraged from pursuing those things. Now it is more acceptable, but there are still subconscious biases that take place. This is why you can see, like, how, how common is it for a little boy to hear, hey, you should go pursue math. Hey, you should go do science. You should do these things. It's not that they're going to actively say, you're a girl, you can't do it. It's more so that that might just not be encouraged for them. And if we know that something as subtle as, another study I'll reference real quickly, is we know that something as subtle as just having a picture in the textbook that depicts a masculine or a man in, uh, as a scientist, is less or it negatively affects women's ability to succeed. There was something that happened in the uh, late 90s called the Scully effect. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but when the X-Files came out, it depicted a female scientist, which wasn't like the first time that happened, but after that, it was called the Scully effect, where a huge increase of girls wanted to be scientists. There is a social component here. It's a lot easier and almost lazier to just say, uh, it's just brains, you know, men are men, women are women, okay? It's a lot more difficult to contend with 
what we can actually change. Nobody's denying that men and women are free to pursue the roles as they will, but we know that throughout, uh, what is it, 800 BC to 1950 AD, virtually 90 per, or excuse me, 95% of all technological and scientific innova innovation came from European men. The idea that that was happening because they were allowed to, and all these women with all these great ideas were just being shut out of the discussion, is just frankly not true. Also, the idea that negative stereotypes are preventing women from going into these fields, we know that's not true as well. There have been several studies proving that if you discourage women, you can't be a scientist, you can't be a doctor. It literally does not affect either their performance nor uh, their interest in those fields. There was a study, though, recently in 2021 that tried to review all of that and say, no, this actually is the case, and then they got caught fabricating their numbers. In terms of the X-Files thing, maybe, but I mean, that's the 1990s. Look, I mean, you're reaching like the peak of when all this messaging, which I can't believe that's you deny nonsense. the fact. There that's are institutions, nonsense, grants, funding, all of these organizations telling women, you can be a doctor, you can be a scientist. When's the last time you saw a straight white man in a commercial? It doesn't exist. All of okay. the programming can in this we, country wait, well, hold on. is I, I recognize that you're, you're trying to go down the special snowflake route here, okay? But before we start playing victim, he never left 2016. there are still massive, hold on, there are still massive amounts of white males on TV, okay? I, I'm pretty confident about that one. But again, even if these institutions are trying to push forward an idea that women can do it, you're ignoring the social component. There is, in fact, different social expectations and stigmas. And I, again, I keep going back to the stay-at-home dad thing because you're trying, you're, you're talking out of two sides of your mouth. You're saying there's not really much of a social stigma, but then you're perpetuating the social stigma. You're trying to discourage women from pursuing these career fields. And I don't know why that is. That's women not are not a slave to their First biology. Of all, on the, the stay-at-home dads thing, I have no ill will or disrespect towards dads who are staying at home. What I am discouraging is the idea that these roles are malleable and it's a simple coin toss. I am saying that men and women or men and women flourish best when they are following their roles, when they are pursuing what is complementary to them in their nature. What are their roles? I'm not that changes. What a role is, and, what a role is for a man it has changed significantly. And you say that. But that's not actually true. It may have changed in terms of things like attire, aesthetics, penis size. But what doesn't change is the Lucky fundamental role of the man as the protector and the provider. Even in the, the societies where men are spending the most time with children, the nurturers, I believe it's like the Aka pygmies in, in Africa, even then, the males are only spending about 40 minutes a day with the child, and the women are still spending 10 times amount that time. So you can say that, oh, the differences are malleable. The big differences are not. I don't really care what some guy's hairstyle was or what his statue was looking like. The biological reality of our situation as articulated has remained the, stain, the same, and it's only changing, not in that all of a sudden women are becoming men and things like that. It's just that now they're not attracted to each other and they're not getting married because of that actual social pressure and actual social conditioning, which you seem to want to ignore. No, this When's is, the last there's time a reason why Anything people are getting married later, again, it can largely be attributed to economic reasons. We can't, again, we can't just point to a problem and just blame whatever we want to blame. It's largely because of economic reasons as to why people are getting married later in life. And again, I am not denying biology. You keep going back to this. However, you're really going to tell me that there was, or excuse me, sorry, there was a time when it was masculine to cry. There was a time when what it meant to be a man, how you were expected to behave, was different. Just if there are some similarities as far as the protective nature, I'm fine with that. Again, a lot of that can be attributed to, yes, biology, testosterone. If you are stronger and by protecting your family, you need to be physically able to fight someone off, yeah, the male's probably going to be the protect, uh, protector. No shit. However, that's one, not necessarily the case nowadays. And two, we would then want to talk about what does it even mean to be the protector? There are different ways to protect a family. Not all of it is physical protection. And so what it means to be a man, how men are expected to behave, has changed. It's different. Nowadays, boys are not encouraged to show emotion. It's considered very weak. It's considered feminine. It's considered girly. But yet, I point to the example of, yes, where it used to be chivalrous for men to, to weep. It was called chivalrous weeping. And that was a thing. That was a masculine trait. So there can be biological uh, consistencies across human history. I'm fine with that. I'm more interested in talking about what we can change. What can we do to make society better? And by acknowledging that there are so certain social expectations that we place on people, we expect them to act a certain way, if we can acknowledge that, that means we can also change these things. We can make it so that families are more stable. We can make it so that if a man 
unfortunately loses his job, he's not more likely to get divorced because his self-esteem is suddenly in the toilet. We can make these changes. We can make the world a better place. Oh, well, I like that. We can all go home on a good note, can't we? Uh, in terms of the emotional aspect of it, I, don't, I have never heard nor witnessed anybody see a man crying at his father's funeral or at the birth of his child and being like, man up, pussy. That's like this sort of like... This is, you're keep, you sort keep of doing like, it. No one says that men shouldn't cry at their father's funeral, dude. But no, but what they day do day say, life, it is men true. Men want that if, to express emotion by crying. If a man is crying at like the ceremony you mentioned, the chivalrous ceremony, no one is going to turn an eye to that then. The same way as something I guess would be the equivalent now. No one would turn an eye to that negatively. The same way now, if you have men crying over things like, I'm like really nervous about this test or back then like, oh, I don't want to do jousting practice. Like, yeah, okay, quit being a little bitch. Like, there's a reason that stoicism is a virtue. As a man, you have to be stoic because like we mentioned in the baby studies, when something goes down, maybe it's changed and oh, maybe you have a gun. Maybe, you know, police are there. I don't know, it depends on what city. People look to you for the answer. People look to you for protection. The little baby girls look to the little baby boys more often than vice versa. That's why stoicism is a virtue as a man. Being in control of your emotions to portray strength is, even if you are weak, no one's saying that weakness is a problem, but you have an obligation to those around you as a man to portray strength, even if that's not the case. This is just also, wrong. You're doing it right now. Also, this idea that because you're a man, you have a responsibility to portray real? strength yes, all you do. the time. That is true. That, no, that is not true. And you're once again enforcing this idea. This is what leads to the repressing uh, emotions, the repressing mechanism, which has already been demonstrated to increase likelihood of committing suicide. Okay. That's not true. The reason men are killing themselves isn't because they can't talk about their emotions. Let's, let's dispel with this fiction that that's the reason that that's going on. Men are killing themselves because we see no way forward. It is harder for us to achieve the economic prospects that our fathers or that our grandmothers have, which Hunter is right. It is because of things like offshoring manufacturing, uh, frankly, gender bias in terms of higher education, things like that. Men just don't see the prospects. And if men don't see a way out of a situation, we are more likely to be despondent. We are more likely to kill ourselves. Also, what's very important about that in terms of the male suicide and how that relates to emotion, like we mentioned earlier, when men were held to the highest standards of how they were supposed to behave as men in the 1950s, they weren't killing themselves as often. They weren't as depressed as often. This is like a new invention right, for whatever because, reason. Because and a I do lot of the problem, well, hold on. A lot of the problems here is that some of these expectations are being almost accentuated. So we have social media, which is isolating people. We still have social expectations that you as a man have a responsibility to give off the impression that you're strong at all times. These things all compounded. Yes, the economy, all of these issues compounded lead to more negative outcomes specifically for men. Okay. Even more so, hold on, they've done studies where they've literally shown that men are less likely to go to the fucking doctor because they perceive that as being weak. These are the type Based. of ideas. That is. <laughs> I'll walk it off. That's funny. That's you can't always walk. <laughs> Some of it you can walk off, but not always. That's funny. Um, one thing I want to get into, and I think this is an interesting phenomenon that we've, we've witnessed often. Well, so that too, I mean, that is men. I don't think it's necessarily weakness. You know, I'm sure the men in the audience, it's not necessarily weakness like, oh, the doctor's going to think I'm, it's more just like, like, who cares? You know, who cares? I think that women tend to be more uh, sort of on the ball with those things, which is good. Well, They're why nurturing. Do They're empathetic. They're like, men you're hurt. Earlier. You don't even know it. I'm going to tell you that. And the men are like, nah, I'm not hurt. And then it is the case. But here's something interesting. Men die earlier, John. I think that anybody, well, it's because we're, you know, taking more risks because of our testosterone, by the way. Testosterone isn't just, I'm doing manual labor. It's your risk aversion. It's your ambition. It's your competition levels. It's everything. And women have less than that. And that's why they are the way that they are, which is lovely, by the way. We love women, don't we, folks? Everyone loves women. No one loves them more than me. That is a fact. But something I did want to get into, this is a very interesting social phenomenon that we're seeing, where I think, even if Hunter may disagree, I don't think he does, there is a monopoly. Time's within... up. Can I continue with my five minutes? Well, you have five minutes next, you can continue then, yes. We're and, starting the oh, second segment. that's not segment. fair at all. We're so back. We have... Trust the plan. I'm going to start... <laughs> I'm going to start crying right here, right now. Well, <laughs> and I will embrace you. I will understand this is very traumatic for you. Um, there is a very interesting phenomenon going on. This will be your five seconds, by We're starting the second segment, so you have five minutes. Okay. Sounds good. Trust the plan. Okay. Um, there's a very interesting phenomenon occurring now 
which is you see throughout all of the institutions literally a monopoly. I mean, we're told, whether it's in the mainstream media or in education, counselors we used to have to meet with when I was like seven years old talking about all these things that children typically wouldn't have thought of before our country became so backwards. Men are taught from a very young age the opposite of what he's claiming with this vague narrative of society. Men are taught it's okay to be soft and tender, express emotions. Men typically don't want to do that. What men like to do when they express emotions is go, this sucks. I'm upset. I'm going to try to channel that in a way that's more productive. They don't like it when you do that because that implies a threat to, frankly, their established power structure. Men getting together and going, this is wrong. I want to change it. And so here's an interesting phenomenon. Look at Jordan Peterson. This guy was teaching at a university in Canada. All of a sudden becomes an overnight sensation. Now he speaks to sold out arenas. <laughs> Missed me. Uh, all throughout the world. <laughs> sold out arenas all throughout the world. And he's teaching young men not to embrace their emotions and whine, but rather get it together, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And his audience is overwhelmingly male. Why is that resonating with young men? Or guys like Andrew Tate. He goes viral overnight telling men, you have to get it together. You have to be better. Contrast this with the self-help literature for women. If you've ever thumbed through one of these, it really is a sobering experience, boys. All of their rhetoric is not, you need to do this. You need to be taking cold showers. You suck. Get better. And guys are like, yes. You read, this, you read the ones that are written for women, it's all like, you deserve to feel like you matter, and you deserve to feel this, and you are entitled to this, which is great. That is what women need to hear, but let's not pretend that these two things are the same. Like we mentioned with their depression, women feel more depressed when they feel like they are not able to contribute to the well-being of those around them. Men feel depressed when we feel like, I don't know what they're doing, but like, I know I'm screwed, and there's no way out of this, and that's just the reality of our situation. And I think that if maybe there, how much time do I have? Oh, okay, we'll do, we'll do a, my tight 15, right, my open mic. If you had situations where all of a sudden people were coming out with this new idea of like, guys, what if we could just like cry? Why would you then not see that overnight viral sensation with people who haven't heard that and gone, wait a minute, this one guy is talking about that. I'm going to follow that. If it were really true that there's this big monopoly of Jordan Peterson's being like, don't cry, man up, you'd expect someone like Hunter Avalon to come onto the scene and be like, actually, you can cry. And then all of a sudden, he would be speaking to sold out arenas, but this just isn't the case. There is a monopoly as evidenced by those who break through as dissenting voices all of a sudden basically achieving like the entire market share because it just doesn't exist because men are taught now that they're supposed to embrace their feelings and be sad and that's okay and women are taught that like well you're supposed to be more assertive and, and less agreeable and things like that and this is fine. Men can be like that. Women can be like that. But ultimately, it is against our nature. And when we start LARPing as these like androgynous freaks, we're less likely to get married. Sure, if the economic prospects were fixed, you'd see more marriages. But it cannot be understated that men know that the state of the modern woman is not so good. And women definitely know that the state of the modern man is also not so good. I mean, the average modern man is like this overweight, porn-addicted slob, and you're like, where's my trad wife? And it doesn't exist. And moreover, the average woman, you know, the birth control, the SSRIs, she's just like all over the place. That's why these social trends through the sexual revolution, by the way, that's inarguable, that's a consensus, that these things have happened, and that is bad. So we actually do have in our power to make the world a better place. We can undo that conditioning. We can undo that propaganda. When me and my cool friends take power, we will. <laughs> You have five minutes. All right, so I think that you said something like men are taught to be in touch with their feelings and talk about their feelings. I recognize that colloquially, emotions and feelings are used interchangeably. I use them interchangeably before, too. However, there actually is a difference between feelings and emotions. So emotions specifically refer to, and John, you're going to love this, a biological response, actual brain chemistry that responds to certain things. This is why sadness is one of the fundamental emotions, whereas anger is actually a secondary emotion. It is still a real emotion, but it's largely because it comes from an underlying foundational emotion. Feelings, on the other hand, are purely conscious. These are things, yes, that you feel in your head, you think about, they're not actually, there's not a biological response. So 
Is there a time and a place to be open and vulnerable about your emotions? Yes, of course. I am not saying that uh, men should just be crying every day, all day, any chance they get. Neither should women. Everybody should have a grasp and, and control over their emotions. But that's called emotional intelligence. And part of being emotionally intelligent is also recognizing the time and the place where it is appropriate to be vulnerable, whether it's with friends or a partner, where it is okay to cry and express sadness. This should not be something that is always looked down upon. It should not be something that men are expected to be stoic at all times. These are harmful ideals. They lead to, I know I've already said this, but they lead to repressing emotions and that increases likelihood of suicide, mental uh, health problems, etc. You also talk about how a lot of the institutions are against this idea or the ideas of masculinity that you're pushing for because masculine men are sort of a threat to the institutions. Um, I, I don't know where you're getting this from because throughout, especially throughout the past hundred years or so, every massive threat to the institutions or the mainstream has been people vocalizing their problems. So if you want to talk about MLK, he challenged the institutions at the time, and that was done vocally. That was not done because he had some physical muscular strength or because he was suppressing his emotions. That didn't happen. People have risen to power time and time again through rhetoric and through being able to win over a crowd rather than being the most muscular, tall, buff dude who's never emotional. You also mentioned earlier, not in the thing you just said, but beforehand, you talked about men sometimes will feel depressed because they fail to... You, you missed me also, I don't know. Let's go. <laughs> but you also said earlier that like, maybe men feel depressed if they're not providing because they're failing to live up to this role, and maybe they... I, I, don't, I know you didn't say maybe they should feel depressed, but you said maybe they feel this way because, yeah, they are, they are failing. We decide what these roles are for men. We have decided that the role is going to be for you as a man to be the primary breadwinner. This does not necessarily have to be the role for a man. So it sounds almost like what you said earlier there that almost kind of proves my point that when you fail to meet or live up to these arbitrary roles, you worsen your own mental well being. You raise the likelihood of divorce. And I don't know why you would be in favor of any of that. Let me see if there's anything else I have here. All right. At the end of the day, I just think it's really important to, again, recognize that biology is real. There's a difference between males and females. Anybody claiming otherwise is delusional. There is a difference between males and females. However, we are not a slave to our biology. We are not a slave to evolution. And women, when they are forced in these roles that are usually seen as more natural for their biology, do not always do well because it's the enforcement that is the problem. It's not necessarily the gender roles that are the problem. John, you have five minutes. Um, you mentioned stoicism, kind of. Stoicism is good. I meant to elaborate on this earlier particularly with men, because our strength gives us a little bit more of an edge uh, than, than women. And our strength has potential to be bad. So if we're not in control of our emotions, things could get bad for those around us pretty quickly. Now, if you take women and give them a little bit of testosterone, which is how you get lesbians, they have the highest, they have the highest rate of domestic abuse. Female-female relationships. I don't know if you know that. That is a fact. Um, repressing emotions, again, has literally no link to suicide. If you look at the people who now are committing suicide, it's not because they didn't think that they could talk about their emotions, well, the men in particular, or because they thought that like uh, everything was just so doom and gloom and there's no outlet. It is because they see no way forward. That is why during the highest standards of that type of society says you can't do this, which would be like virtually any year from our history, probably even human history, up until the 19th 1950s and 1960s, men weren't committing suicide at even comparable rates to what they are now. So the only thing that changed is that Hunter's ideas became normalized through the long march of the institutions, and my ideas didn't. And now all of a sudden men are committing suicide. To which this will say, well, you can't just attribute it to one problem. And it's like, well, I'm not. I mean, you look at the state of who's committing the most suicide in this country, it's white men. 
Why is that? White men are demonized in virtually every institution. They are taught that they are lesser than, they're not as cool or unique as women or people of color or whatever. And because of that, they don't see a way forward. They are literally discriminated against. Because by the way, when you say that they're, oh, we're favoring women, we're favoring people of color, that's a really interesting PR way of saying that you are discriminating against white men. And of course, that's why they're committing suicide. If it were because of these harmful cultural stereotypes, you'd expect Asian men, who of course we all know are held to far higher standards of how they should conduct themselves as men and as women, but they're not committing suicide in this country nearly at the rate that white men are. So argument, BTFO'd, liberalism canceled. Um, also, he brought up the MLK thing. We're excited about this. MLK, like feminism, was literally propped up by elite donors because they wanted to see social change in the country. This is a fact. I don't have time to elaborate on it here. I did a whole hour and a half video explaining this history. This is a very common liberal historiography. They go through these long social changes, usually enforced by legislating from the bench on the Supreme Court, and then they write the history books such as, everyone just woke up one day and thought, you know what, men can get married. Black people, they're not that bad. What is this crazy backwards? Your grandpa was a racist. He didn't know better than we do now. This is obviously not the way that history actually goes. It is always propped up through the institutions, and then after they seize the power, it's always, hey, good guys won again. What are the odds? So in terms of, oh, speaking truth to power, it wasn't so much that. It's status. It's charisma, how you seize power, which, again, are all things that men tend to display more and that women tend to almost exclusively be attracted to when seeking partners. So who's enforcing this? Women, literally women. There's not like this vague zeitgeist of society. Who's enforcing this? He's right. It is men and women because as much as me or as much as we might like to say, oh, you know, we all want to be egalitarian or whatever. If you go tell your wife like, hey, I actually want to be staying at home and I actually like want to be like super soft and tender, try that. I dare you to try that experiment because that feminist conditioning will erode very quickly. She will all of a sudden view you as a pathetic, impotent loser, and she will move on to somebody who displays more stereotypically masculine traits. That is a fact. Name me one pop culture figure who has been propped up on a girl's, you know, door or whatever that has been like this, like, maybe recently with like Harry Styles, you know, estrogen, it is what it is, but it's John Wayne, it's James Bond, it's all of these characters. Even now, no one's looking at like a, a hero in a movie and being like, wow, this guy's like so cool. I just like love the way that he was like super open about how saving the city like affected him. It's like no one cares. No one cares. Being cool, calm, collected, that is what people think is cool. And uh, yeah, in terms of slave to biology, those people are the happiest. Like, oh my gosh, I am doing the thing that I am programmed to do. I'm happiest all of a sudden. This is so odd. We're not talking about being a slave to biology the way a lot of hunters' constituents are, where they're like, if it feels good, do it. We're actually talking about the opposite. Controlling biology insofar as you're going to transcend the level of an ape, but also following that which you were programmed to do by evolution or by Jesus Christ, which is get together, get married, and have lots of kids. So this idea that if you go home to your wife and want to talk about your feelings, she's somehow going to leave or something, uh, just isn't borne out at all by the data. There did a study of... It's okay, guys. You can talk it over with a therapist, okay? So they did a study of over 1,500 women, and they found that 95% of those women said that they would prefer a man who is, yes, open about his emotions. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just about making sure you're being open about your emotions in an appropriate time and place. You say that people are happier when they follow their biology or whatnot. Uh, this isn't necessarily true. I, I feel like you're just forgetting what I already said about the stay-at-home moms who have more depression, the women who have more negative experiences and negative emotions when they are in these caregiving positions. Being forced in these positions or being forced or even expected to adhere to your biological uh, nature does not make people happier, and many times it makes people worse off. You say that there's no link to suppressing emotion and suicide. I'm going to quote one of your favorite institutions, probably in the entire world, the American Psychological Association, which has weighed in and said that a lot of these rigid roles that we expect from men do, in fact, contribute, yes, to depression, more substance abuse, and early death. You talk about Asian men. You say that, well, what about Asian men? They have these expectations. I, I'm not super hip on that, but I don't know what Asian men are expected to not cry 
They have expectations, sure, but I don't know how much of those expectations are suppress emotion. So it's not just expectations that are the problem, it's harmful expectations. You talk about MLK uh, having donors or whatnot, that's fine. That doesn't mean that he wasn't ultimately challenging the broad institutions at the time and pushing against the narrative that was commonplace at the time, which was, yes, a racist narrative, this idea that black people and white people were, uh, were, were, or black people were lesser, they need to be segregated, whatnot. MLK was using his voice to challenge many of these institutions at the time, and receiving donations does not disprove that. Last but not least, you talk about what women are attracted to. You say that it's women who are doing this. I don't know why you don't think that women couldn't also be socialized. If women are born into a world where they too are taught, hey, what a good man looks like is someone who's stoic, dominant, aggressive, never uh, shows his emotions, then she's more likely, yes, to be attracted to that kind of equality. This is why, for example, back a long time ago, fat women were seen as more attractive because it symbolized wealth, it symbolized power. And so even what we as humans find, attraction, or, or find attractive, that can change. And so if women find certain masculine norms as being attractive, that does not disprove anything that I've said about the socialization aspect. So Tradcon owned. <laughs> All right, that ends our second segment. And we will now move on to the closing statements since you guys agreed that John would have a longer opening but a short closing. John, you will have five minutes for your closing. He mentioned therapy, therapists, things like that. You'll notice when you talk about therapy culture, if you pry long enough, what people like about their therapists is that they basically provide to them someone to speak to. And it is true, as we've both mentioned, that there has been a social degradation in this country, and that is very bad. But the answer to that is not to like become weaker and become more like whiny about things. The answer is to actually try and go about fixing that, which you can only do through strength. Um, and you know, you're not going to convince me that some like you know 93 IQ, you know 27 year with like a psych degree is really going to provide insight, uh, insight into my problems that like my dad won't or my grandpa won't or what have you. Um, you know, women saying, well, I wish my man would be more open about his emotions. Of course she said that. I can't figure out what he's thinking. Try it. I dare you to try. Make, you know, if you're really upset about something, that's fine. I respect that. Every day, complain to your woman. Complain about, or I should, uh, not your woman. I shouldn't say that. That's possessive. Complain to your partner about what your respective problems may be. See how far that gets you. She will pretty soon portray or perceive you to be weak, and she will not be interested in you uh, for very much longer after that. In most cases, there are exceptions, but this is a tendency that does exist. Um, in terms of it makes them uh, happier in, or sorry, he said it doesn't make them happier being slaves to biology, being in these relationships. But the metric for that that he cited was they, perform, uh, they report more feelings of stress, of struggling, of being unhappy temporarily. That's sure. But like we said in the data that was cited in my intro, of the women who are the happiest, they are all those who have said they've had to make concessions and sacrifices for their family. That is what meaning is, making sacrifice for something that is greater than oneself, being stressed out, dealing with obnoxious children. I'm not pretending that it's like this very happy experience. It is stressful. But ultimately, the magic that you will be able to create in that child's life as a parent is greater than anything else that you could ever pursue on this planet. That is true. MLK challenging the power structures, what, like, you mean the federal government that was on his side and literally had, like, white students at Bayonet when they were forcing integration? That power, really speaking truth to all the billionaires in society who benefited from that, um, watch the video. In terms of the APA guidelines, what he's re uh, referring to there are some guidelines that were issued by the APA, which, of course, is notoriously uh, bipartisan, talking about how these harmful standards of masculinity hurt men's feelings. This was basically laughed at. There were multiple studies, including one uh, that was peer-reviewed by about 12 different scholars, saying that not only does this not reflect the data that we have on males and females, it's actually like clinically not even useful and perhaps might even be more harmful than it would be useful in addressing the problems that males might be more likely to feel. The fat women are attractive. Opposite is the case. Men, because men, status, resources. I am sorry to say this, but there has not been a case in human history where people have looked at fat women and been like, nice. It just, it doesn't exist. And also, even if that is the case, who in those other cultures? I mean, oh, maybe it is true, but it's standards. Well, who is sending these letters to the pygmies in Africa, to people in Iran, to people in Venezuela, Vietnam? Who is telling these people, you actually have to be like really like, you know, stoic and you have to be the provider and the protector? These things are downstream from our biology. He has not been able to actually acknowledge the implication of that. He'll say, of course, the fact that men and women are different. True. 
But he refuses to get into the implications of that in terms of how it affects our behavior differently, which is universally the same throughout the world, throughout world history, and also with babies. If it were true that like neuroplasticity, you would expect to see like a little bit of leeway. Maybe if we're ambitious 50-50. I would even settle with 10%, but it's not. It is virtually always the same. And that is because men are men, women are women, and I'm kind of like an Aristotelian natural law kind of guy, kind of like a Jesus kind of guy. So so if you are following that which you are programmed to do, chances are it's going to optimize your capacity for flourishing as a human being. Right now, contrary to my opponent's belief, the institutions are actively dissuading people, actively making it more difficult to get married, to meet a moral spouse. But that does not mean that our biology has changed. And perhaps there is a reason for the fact that the individual who is the most likely to benefit from the freedom of my opponent's ideas is also the profile of the most depressed person in this country. That is the middle-aged, single, working woman with no children. Why is she the most depressed if she has had the most to benefit throughout the last 60 years of social engineering? And if she isn't the most depressed, or if she is, but it's just like a temporary dip, we're buying at the dip, let me know when the uptake is, and I'll look forward to like egalitarian, gender-inclusive Wakanda or something. All right, Hunter, you have 10 minutes for your closing before we move on to the Q&A. I'm probably not gonna need 10 minutes. So, John, you keep going back to the biology thing, and then I just keep saying the same thing, and then it's like a repeat constantly. So, I already have acknowledged that there is biological differences, and even if people are behaving certain ways because of their biology, that's fine. None of that is the problem. The problem is when you try to enforce this, when you try to stigmatize people who do not adhere to your preferred version of these gender roles. You even did it just a minute ago when you started talking about therapy. You started, you, you, you associated therapy with weakness, with being weak. It is not weak to seek help for your mental well-being. That is not weakness. And the fact that you're considering it to be weak is again demonstrating my point. This idea that if men are vulnerable or they show emotion or they go to therapy that they're somehow weak or lesser of a man, that is contributing to more depression, that is contributing to higher suicide rates for men, and that's also contributing to the potential to destabilize marriages, as I've already said in my opening. You also talk about men being strong and strength and how important that is. Strength is important across the board. This strength is not something that's only important for men. Everybody should be strong in their own respect. And one of the ways you can be strong is also by being vulnerable, is also by recognizing the time and the place to express emotions, even if that is uncomfortable. A strong person is able to be in touch with their emotions and work through that through a healthy way, not by just suppressing it and being stoic because I gotta be a man, bro. You talk about um, how quickly your partner would get fed up if you're constantly complaining to them. I agree. Talking about your emotions is not the same thing as complaining. Nobody likes a complainer, but talking about your emotions is not the same thing as complaining all the time to your partner. You also talk about uh, women being happier when they've sacrificed for their family. I think this is a perfect example of a really good value that doesn't need to be gendered. The idea that you should sacrifice for your, 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 own, di uh, your own desires for the family, yes, you should. If you have a family, then sorry, you are in many ways no longer number one. You do have to make sacrifices, but this isn't just for women, this isn't just for men, and if women were happier, I'm sure that you can find studies that show that men are happier as well, because having children and having a family is one of the best and most fulfilling experiences that you can have in life. So this is a perfect example of where something does not need to be gendered. A lot of these ideas that I think you push for under the guise of traditional gender roles are not necessarily bad. Provide for your family. Be strong when the time and the place is appropriate. These are good things. Be the breadwinner. Provide for your family. All of these things I agree with. I don't agree with you wanting to stigmatize people who break away from that. And I also don't agree that these need to be gendered. I think that a lot of these values are really good values to have, but they're good values for everybody to have. And I think that that's really the most important thing that we should be looking at. So at the end of the day, gender roles are largely influenced by society. We can make a change, and if we can acknowledge where some of these expectations are doing harm, then that means that we can all work towards making a better future for men, for women, and for the stability of the nuclear family. 
So these are all the reasons why I don't think that traditional gender roles need to be enforced. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter, and thank you, John. So I'll give a round of applause to our debaters, please. If you would like to ask a question, we're gonna form a line right here where everybody can ask a question. We have 20 minutes, and before we get kicked out of here and we have to do the quick meet and greet at the end of it, but if you'd like to ask a question, just line up here and we'll have somebody hold a mic and you can ask any question. Please specify who it's towards, if it's Hunter, John, or both of them. We'll just need a quick minute to set up the camera here and then we'll be starting the Q&A. Yeah, so this is for Hunter, and uh, John actually touched on this a little bit, about specifically the men who commit suicide more is white men. And looking at the past in America, we see white men have been the most emasculated by far. Looking at other people, like John brought up Asians, Asians have very strong gender roles, generally speaking. If you look at black men, they're often perceived as a lot more masculine. If you look at Hispanic men, you know, they want to go out and build houses for 12 hours a day. Uh, <laughs> So my question is, if you see this evidence, once you break down subsets of men pointing to John being right, how do you actually explain that? Well, when it comes to a lot of these issues, kind of like I said, I think that a lot of it is accentuated by other circumstances as well. So just if you see differences in certain men's well-being as compared to other men, does not mean that there isn't still certain social stigma that can play a role. So sure, maybe, uh, I don't know what the suicide rate is specifically for black men as opposed to white men, but last I checked, there is still a higher suicide rate in that area. So a lot of this, again, it comes back to two things, is one, certain social expectations, but it's not just social expectations, it's the fact that these social expectations have been accentuated by other circumstances, like a poorer economy, less job opportunity, less socialization, and more social media and more isolation. Uh, this one's for John. Um, is it safe to say that the reason you are currently single is that you're saving yourself for Brett Cooper? Oh man. <laughs> Look, she's a very nice girl. I, I've met her in person. We get along great. Okay, I'm a businessman. My job is to get along with people. Uh, tremendous girl doing great work over at Daily Wire, and uh, you know, I wish her the best with all of that. He's blushing. <laughs> well, I don't mean that, and like I'm He's just blushing. Saying, very fine person, very fine person. I hear great things about Brett. Hey, John, thanks for being here tonight. I must say, you're looking very sharp, very handsome, as always. Um, my question is unrelated to this debate, but with Trump announcing tomorrow, I'm just uh, curious your condensed view on the Trump 2024 situation. My what on the Trump 24 your situation? Condensed view, just on it all. Uh, well, my condensed view, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I'm not. Are the cameras off? <laughs> We're not streaming, but the cameras are on. I can say this, by then it'll be passed. Uh, yours truly is actually headed to a very special place tomorrow for a Let's very go. special announcement, which I'm very excited about. Um, look, I've been on the Trump train for seven years. I mean, I just did a whole two hour video about why that is. The bottom line is basically that there is something very real about the, we call it the friend enemy distinction in politics. For some reason, all of our enemies as normal American people are aligning themselves with challengers like Ron DeSantis. He is talking to the same establishment donors that were supporting people like Jeb Bush. I mean, that's who he's in bed with. He also doesn't have the name recognition, he doesn't have the ego, and he doesn't have the money to fund a campaign independently like Donald Trump did. So if he wants to take on literally the most power, uh, popular political figure in America, he's gonna have to get in bed with the worst people in the country who are watering the mouth waiting for him to do so. He wouldn't get it. It would be political suicide. I hope he's going to be smart. But uh, yeah, I am on the Trump train. I would do anything that Donald Trump told me. I don't, you know, at any point. Um, and if Ron DeSantis is the nominee, then I'm going to go work for Gavin Newsom's campaign. Hi, this question is for John. Um, I just had some points of like clarification I wanted to ask you about. So in your opening, you claimed that men are more interested in like games, like uh, competition-based activities and items, correct? Yes. And women are more interested in cooperation uh, activities like that and are more focused on people, right? Yes. 
and you also claimed that women, I don't remember your wording, but women uh, define success as something that helps others. If you could remind me exactly what you said right then. Yeah, um, there was a, a study done and it showed that women are far more likely, almost over three times more likely, to say that they agree with the sentence that is, uh, I am happiest when I am doing something that makes other people around me happy, um, things like that. And women, I mean, as we know, now that we don't have to like, you know, cite sources or whatever, everyone knows that women are much more social than men, that they're much more concerned about what others think than men are. Men are far more independent, men are far more focused on you know, the sort of introspective element of it. Um, and so, yeah, it is true that in terms of females pursuing things which make them the happiest, that is largely implicated by the attitudes of those around them. Okay, great. So I just had a question of, with all that being said, why do you think male, like males are better leaders? Because personally, I would want a leader who is more like cooperative and more relationship and um, personally based and rather than someone who is only looking for um, like just competition and more focused on items, um, material objects, if you could sure. explain that to um, me. I think that when you're talking about political power, when working up the ladder, that's one thing. But in terms of like who a leader should be, I don't think that they necessarily have to be uh, concerned about the opinion of the masses, so to speak. I mean, I'm anti-liberal, anti-democratic, democracy is cringe, we all know the line. Because the masses are, uh, to quote the Iranian gentleman, like retarded. Like people are heavily influenced by what they're seeing on the screen. And so I think that leaders are inspiring loyalty maybe by being the guy who has the best reputation in terms of making good decisions, but also things are very important like charisma, saying things that people resonate with. I'm not saying that that is the only thing that makes a good leader, but I think that's ultimately far more fatalistic in what actually gets us our leaders. And so I don't think that taking uh, the input, maybe in a situation if you know everyone in this room were gonna go get food, that would be okay. But if you poll people on issues now, especially after decades of media conditioning, uh, I don't exactly trust the opinion of them. You need someone to get in there and just do what is right regardless of the opinion of like the masses. And I mean, Plato articulated this quite well with the ship. You know, we may all be affected by the decisions of the captain, but that doesn't mean that we get to all take turns steering the wheel. There are people who are competent. They are natural aristocrats. They know what is best, and God bless them if they can get towards the necessary levels of power uh, to actually use that for good. But our system, because it is democratic, has actually basically incentivized like the most sociopathic and evil people to get to power because it's dependent on if people like you. Okay, well, people give you money who want you to say these things and then their friends in the media promote you as like the superstar candidate. Whereas, you know, if you had a monarchy or something like that, you were trained from birth to have an obligation to your people, to the lower classes, to the peasants. You don't see that now because everything is, you know, free open society. Now the upper class almost feels like they earned it or something, like the lower classes are therefore lesser than. And this wasn't the case in uh, formerly or anti-democratic societies throughout history, if that makes sense. So I think you avoided my question a little bit because everything you described on um, like a leader, they don't need to be like cooperation like based or like be more interested in like people rather than things, women can do what you just said, like get in there and not necessarily do what everyone does and make everyone happy, but do what is right. Women can do that. Um, and it's like you kind of went off around, you kind of avoided my question about like democracy and stuff like that. So what exactly like makes like males like better leaders than women? I apologize. I thought you were appealing to democracy in your question in terms of like considering the opinion of the people over whom they govern. Um, in terms of like what makes a man a better leader, he's far less influenced by emotions. He's far more willing to do what needs to be done for the people over whom he governs than women are. Women are far more likely to allow emotional uh, impulses to govern their judgments. And I think that the historical record is very clear that this doesn't make for good societies. Even frankly, you know, a, a common talking point is like, I wish we had a woman in charge. She'd go to war less. If you look at female leaders between 1400 and 1900 AD in Europe, there are far more likely to declare war and go to war with these other countries than male leaders were. So I think that would probably be it. We're more stoic, we're more composed, you know, things like that. Which I'd I like know is like a really sexist quick. point of view, but it's sexist insofar as it understands gender the same way like a dentist would understand teeth, I think. I want to lay, weigh in on this really quickly. So obviously what makes a good leader is going to depend on w in what context they need to lead. So for example, 
they've done studies where they found that when women are in top executive positions in over, they studied over 1,000 different companies, and they found that companies that had women in top executive positions, those companies outperformed all of their competitors by near 25%. Even more so, this idea that uh, women are governed by their emotion and men are just the rational ones is just complete nonsense. So there's two different studies that completely just debunk this, okay? The first one being a study that was done recently where they tracked over 152 men and women, and a group of those women were actually even on their period at the time, John, and they found that men and women in that group all reported near identical emotional fluctuation. Not to mention, they've done another study where they presented men and women with complex moral decisions regarding torture, animal science, abortion, things like this. And they did find that women had a more emotional response. However, the rationale behind the decisions made were no different. Men and women were virtually identical when it came to making rational decisions. Emotion is not actually the antithesis to rationale. I have a brief response to that I was implicated. The study that he's referring to with the, uh, the corporate executives thing, this is a very ad hoc sort of approach where you have these corporations, they don't want a media backlash, they want to look favorable to their donors and everything, so they appoint women to avoid lawsuits. I'm sure they do a great job, but in terms of leadership, who's going to get you across the river, not be across already and be like, okay, my turn. Show me a company that's trading on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange that was started in a garage and becomes like a multi-billion dollar company. Every one that you can show me that was started by women and led to that success, there's a hundred that were started by men. This is just the nature of the game. I'm sorry. In terms of experience versus, um, you know, the emotional experience versus acting on that, like we said, men are better at controlling that emotion. We might experience it, but we're better at controlling it. Better decisions as implicated by like they treated animals better, I guess. I don't know. They were there, moral well, decisions. They were, they were questions. That's asked. even in you itself the Egalitarian, you know, your moral obligation is to your people, and I don't care if like it's easier to move the raccoon out of the deck instead of shoot it with a shotgun. Like at a certain point, you just have to do what is right by the people. So, and again, the historical record speaks for this. I mean, we really think that if like it was you know women instead of men that we'd all be better off. I don't think anybody actually thinks that. I, th maybe there's a study with some fun you know hypothetical ethical experiments. That's great, but we've had thousands of years of this, and I think that the record is pretty clear. Well, the thousands of years that you keep referencing are ignoring all kinds of context there, first and foremost. Second of Humans all, are flawed. I don't, well, hold on, wait. Six. I don't know why you're, you're telling a bedtime story right now to the audience about this study. You're making something up because you're coping over the fact that this study clearly shows that when women are in top executive positions, the companies outperform their competitors by near 25%. This was a study done in 29 different countries with over 1,000 companies. So you can't just tell a story and try to explain it away. That's coping. You totally can. Show me then those decisions that were made. Establish a common variable and then find some causal link from there. You're going, oh my gosh, the biggest companies are implementing DEI training. But this is like evidence of it's winning. No, show me one that has been built from the ground up by a disproportionate amount of female leaders relative to men and then I will believe you. But this there is just not the case. Women-owned businesses all over the place obviously are still significantly in the minority. However, again, the study that I'm uh, keep referencing. I don't, you, you keep on trying to like run away from and say, show me someone, a woman who started a company in a garage. No. The study that I'm referencing demonstrates that there is a strong correlation between women in top executive positions and the company performing better. What that demonstrates is that women do very much have the potential to be far better leaders or just be as good of leaders as men. Which I accept the possibility of that. But this idea that, like, okay, so that's one way to look at it. He is accurate in that. Another way to look at it, which is probably the case, which is that big companies have a social incentive to include more women, more people of color in their top executives. There are NGOs and leftist institutions that literally track this, and if someone's out of line, they have their media watchdog groups go after these people, which affects Here's the, the stock. This is the cope. Rationalization is a cope, ladies and gentlemen. This Don't ever cope, think buddy. about things. Believe the screen people. No, rationality is not the cope, but trying to just fill in the blanks and say, well, they were probably all just like liberal institutions who were incentivized. Literally, yes. That's coping. All right, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this question is for John. Um, you advocated for the restoration of traditional gender roles, and um, you claimed that that was due to our biological proclivities. So like, 
if we were to go about restoring those, would you say it is more on our part to do a proactive like instillment of those behaviors, or is it more of just like a hands-off, you know, repealing of the long march through the institutions? Um, both. I mean, it depends on what level or what level level of power you and the individual's uh, life would would achieve. I mean, if you're in a position where you can actually remove some of these negative incentives, by all means, do that. But ultimately, not everyone is going to be in that position, so uh, it's not really one or the other. I think there is a little bit of nuance there. And you know, you in your own life can accept that you, as a man, are the provider. You are, you know, the protector and things like that. And you'll find women actually respect you a lot more for that. I'm sure there are very successful relationships out there where this is not the case, but again, we were talking about tendencies and biological realities, which are, of course are upheld throughout culture and world history, things like that. So if you as a man are looking to become a better man, you can look at all the men throughout history who built a country and you can be like, I kind of want to act more like that. I mean, why does this not make sense? They clearly had a general idea as to what they were doing, much more so than people who now want to write articles for Vox.com talking about how like going to therapy is like actually good. You want to reduce symptoms of depression? What, go to a therapist, get prescribed like what, Prozac? Creatine, the workout supplement, <laughs> outperforms SSRIs in terms of reducing symptoms of depression. You want to stop being depressed? Get vitamin D, go outside, get active. That's how you reduce it in at least men. Thank you. All right. uh, my question's for John. Um, one day, when you're super cool friends and you take power, <laughs> what is the plan to address uh, sort of the egalitarian anti-marriage propaganda in media and in you know, politics? And, and what do you do in those positions of power to address that? Um, well, I'll tell you something as a white pill. I just got back from D.C. and I was meeting with a lot of behind the scenes people because normally I'm in media and so my idea of how over it is is like it's over because all the media people are stupid. Political people behind the scenes are very smart and they are very calculated. Uh, like it's incredible what these people can think of and, th and that's really the nature of politics. You know, we can talk about like in the media democracy and things like that. Behind the scenes, everyone's very aware of what's going on because it's a political power struggle and so that was fun for me to hear about. But in terms of things like that, practical solutions, repealing uh, well, the Civil Rights Act, that would be a great start. That violates the Constitution, real. Uh, repealing things like no-fault divorce, things like that would be very good. Also, if you really wanted to like infiltrate things like uh, the FCC, make it illegal to maybe broadcast things which are in contradiction to the flourishing of people. You can always find ways to word it or things like that. I'd You'd get canceled, John. I would be completely in support of that. Are you kidding Taking me? Like, you know, this idea, oh, you know, God, this is going on in the media. That's what you're supposed to do. No, no, thank you. We want men. We want women. That's what's normal. That's what we should be promoting to people. So there are ways you can do it, and uh, it's really going to be dependent on when we can actually take over that power, which the historical record would say is going to be probably within our lifetimes, which is very exciting. So, yeah. Thank you both for coming to Knoxville. Look at that guy's shoes. All right, so my question is for Hunter. And uh, do you think the increased consumption of processed foods, seed oils, and xenoestrogens from the 1950s to now, which is a proven direct correlation in a decrease in testosterone within men, has led to a progressive collapse in traditional gender roles, or is it purely due to like evolving social norms? Sure. So, I mean, I would have to look into that. Uh, I haven't looked into it. But if I take your word for it, yeah, then yes, of course, there are varying different reasons as to why specifically testosterone levels are dropping. Um, and that could very well be one of them, yes. On top of that, there is also the uh, less demand for physical labor jobs, which reduces testosterone. And then, although not the only cause, even something as simple as smoking cigarettes actually S cigarettes used to increase testosterone, now that's uh, decreasing. So we are seeing testosterone levels decrease and the, the processed foods could definitely be uh, at play there, sure. But just to be clear, the social gender roles are not necessarily the same as, as testosterone levels dropping or rising. Can I respond to that? Um, it is completely correlated with testosterone. I mean, you are your hormones. It influences every organ in your body, including your brain. And it is no coincidence that as we've seen men become more feminine, they start to challenge these ideas of like, oh, maybe I should just talk about my emotions more. Maybe I should just be more sensitive, things like that. It's completely correlated. And you're right on with the testosterone, with the seed oils. It's all lifestyle related. Hunter is also right with the manufacturing, well, the labor jobs, things like that, which we addressed. Those should come back. We should bring those back. We want free trade, but it has to be fair. And so those are all problems. But another thing that you're seeing 
seeing is this idea that like, oh, testosterone is just doing this. It's just weird how that happens. Even as men get older, oh, it just drops when you're older. That is true, but a large component of that which is not addressed is the decades of accumulation of lifestyle factors that are harmful towards your endocrine system, which finally cause your testosterone to drop later in life. Obviously, that's going to happen anyways, but in terms of the proportion at which it's happening, largely because of environmental factors. Also, would you like the red pill on cigarette smoking? This is something very interesting. Yes. So I just heard this this weekend, actually. Um, we've been smoking forever. I mean, this country was built on tobacco and caffeine. But the lung cancer only started somewhat recently when we started using things to fertilize and things to uh, pesticides, things like that, that were integrating traces of phosphate, which is actually bioaccumulative with uh, trace amounts of radiation. And so when you're smoking things that have, and that does affect the tobacco, over time that has caused for rates of lung cancer to increase. And another great example of this is you look over in Japan, East Asia, they smoke like chimneys. They never had the same problems with lung cancers or mouth cancers that we did until borders open up. Now all of those Western cigarette brands are very popular in Japan, and now they're starting to see that tip up or tick up. So it's not so much the tobacco in itself, probably not the best idea, but it's like in terms of, oh, I don't want to do it because I get cancer. You can grow your, well, I don't think that's legal. One could grow their own tobacco, <laughs> and they could avoid those problems to a large degree. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So uh, my question's for John, and you had mentioned that there's you know, institutions that are telling like, white people to have less kids. Do you think a possible way to like, troll these institutions like, for the memes would be to have more kids? <laughs> yeah, well, so that's the thing. Like, there's no greater demonstration to the regime than just like marrying and, and having a bunch of kids. They literally call it ecological terrorism. Now they don't do this in countries that aren't white. They say that's fine. It's only in Western countries, which are predominantly white, that they run this propaganda. And it's also always white people. I mean, you never see the fertility rate with immigrants uh, from Latin America or Asia, the fertility rate with African Americans, which is substantially higher than that of the white American fertility rate. That's never criticized. It's always white people having kids. They literally, and too, this is reflected throughout the sort of cultural zeitgeist. People will share Twitters or uh, tweets of, see, I'm illiterate. I've been kicked off Twitter. I don't remember how it works. People will share photographs of like large white families on Twitter. And you'll see all these people retweeting it. There's something just wrong about this. They have been just instinctively off put to this idea of white people getting together and having kids. And honestly, like for that reason, I'd like to say it's because God, and it is, but spite is also something to consider. And so I think that it's absolutely right to troll the globalists, troll the libtards. We should just get together and have a bunch of kids and be happy. You'll be happier for it, which my opponents even acknowledged. Can I weigh in just really quickly on that? Um, so I, I recognize that there have certainly been some pretty cringy articles that have been discouraging people to have children. I don't know where the institutional push is for this, especially considering the fact that even now, I mean, the government in many ways can provide, well, it doesn't provide health care for everybody, even though it should, but the government can also provide different forms of welfare or uh, Medicaid, which also helps people to have children as well. So I think that the idea that there's like this institutional push for white people to not have kids, I don't know where the institutional push is. When you talk about the cringy tweets, yeah, it's Twitter. You can find almost any cringy shit on there. And it is cringy, by the way, to act like there's something wrong with people having children or because it's bad because white people have kids. That's all cringe. I don't know where the institutional push is. All I've seen are some cringy articles and some idiots on Twitter. A lot of professors have been fired because they've been caught in their classrooms, you know, repeating anti-white sentiments, calling for white genocide, calling for, you know, extermination of white people, calling us inherently racist, inherently a cancer. So it's in academia. It's obviously in the media. Um, I mean, it's increasingly in things like the military. They're trying to expand the foreign legion so you have more non-American people coming into the country, being in the military, which is, of course, a very important institution for people sympathetic to our ideas to control. So uh, I would actually wonder what institution is this not happening in? I mean, it's in all the NGOs. It's in the activist groups. It's in the courts. It's, it's everywhere. It's like a cancer. And then that is, of course, being uh, trickled down, if you will, into the psyche of the masses. Well, I had kids despite the regime, so I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter. Um, my next question would be uh, with regards to mail-in voting. So to my understanding, you know, one of the reasons Democrats may be able to make some gains in some spots and pick up some seats is that they've developed pretty strong mail-in voting where they're essentially able to get uh, Democrats that don't turn out very often to turn out more consistently and that can like swing elections. Yeah. In turn to fight back, I believe that we should also establish our uh, mail-in voting programs and build uh, you know, a system that way. Would you agree with that? Or? 
the idea is interesting. The problem is our people would never go for something like that. They would just be, because first of all, there's this sort of ethos of like, well, my principles and things like that. But then the other side of it is like, people just like to get out and go and vote. And uh, the people who the Democrats are relying on not voting so they can use those ballots, people who are going to vote for Republicans tend to turn out very well. With Democrats, it's not exactly the case, but I, I'll recall my experience in DC. It was very interesting because people who work in media, people who consume political media, always want to use these very romantic terms to talk about, you know, voter fraud, it's happening, they're doing this. When you actually talk to people in DC, Democrats or Republicans, it's always just like, yeah, and just go back to eating. And it's like, and so this is like really bad and like wrong, right? I don't know. Like, it's just so matter of fact to them. And so once Republicans, I guess, age into the level of uh, willingness to maybe do what needs to be done to restore election integrity, then we can probably start to win elections again if we have enough time for that. But in the meantime, there's a reason that 2022 and 2020 went a certain way, and it's exactly because of what you've described. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I just want to say that John got a compliment. So Hunter, you were looking dashing today. Thank I'm, you. I'm jealous of your wife. Um, <laughs> though, Many are. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I do have a question, though. Um, I understand you're looking at this prob the problem of mental health in America from two diff very different viewpoints. Um, what can we do as individuals practically to help with this problem? Yeah, so I think that a lot of the times um, we as humans, I don't know, in the politics sphere, either way, we tend to create dichotomies that don't have to exist. So I don't think the issue is, like what John said, go outside more, vitamin D, working out. He's right. These are all extremely beneficial for your mental well-being. But it's also true that therapy and even medication, if necessary, can also be beneficial for your well-being. It's not an either or. It's not competing ideals. It's that if you as an individual are feeling depressed and you're not looking to go to a therapist or take any kind of like pharmaceutical medication, then you should go outside. You should exercise. You should get out of your bubble. Try to make friends. There are ways that you can uh, improve your own life just by doing these simple things. Um, but again, it's not a dichotomy. It's not either or. They're not competing. They oftentimes will work very well together. Um, I would say that it is also true that testosterone does decrease depression in men, uh, and that's why women are more likely to experience you know, feelings of depression just because their emotions are what they are. Men are much less likely to experience that unless we're in a situation where the environment is particularly intruding to what we perceive to be our future well-being. Um, and your brain, I mean, it's not just this thing. It is an organ. It is warning you that something is wrong. And oftentimes, I mean, you're seeing our generation in particular, they're inside all day, they're looking at screens all day, they don't have that community like Hunter mentioned, and they're depressed and they think that like some lab coat has come up with a pill that's gonna make them feel happy and it ends up just turning them into like a zombie or something. And again, creatine outperforms SSRIs. Another thing though, it is very true, in male social circles, there's always been this sort of, and this is a good critique, though I do think it's funny, so maybe I'll be more balanced. There's always this like sexual McCarthyism Right? Like, what are you, gay? And you know, it's charming, it's endearing. But there is something to be said about being able to be vulnerable with your male friends. You shouldn't do this on the internet. You shouldn't do this in public. I know it feels good to have everyone in the comments like, you're so brave. You should do this with trusted friends. And I think that establishing those male social circles, which honestly exists more than people might think, where it is okay to talk about your problems in a confided and confident sense, I think that it actually does make people feel that sense of community, which could be contributing to depression, but I think with young men in particular, it's probably half and half between that and just lifestyle factors in terms of not being active enough. I actually agree a lot that, yeah, having a community of friends is incredibly important for mental well-being. Although, what you said about depression is warning you. I don't think that that's a very accurate summary of depression. I mean, they've looked at the brains of depressed people, and they've found decreases in activity in the hippocampus, for example. So there are problems in the brain specifically that are sort of causing these feelings, and I don't think that those uh, that, that feeling of, of despair or sadness or dread is necessarily like a warning that there's actually something wrong. He's exactly right. There is a chemical difference in the brain. And the reason for that is because you're actually more than just like this meat sack and then a brain. I mean, you also have a soul. There is body, mind, and soul. And so if you take that into account that there is a greater purpose, there is something greater than ourselves, you might do something that is morally wrong and think to yourself, I feel a state of despair because of this. You can explain it neurochemically and be like, oh, despair is actually when this secretes less of this hormone or whatever. You're experiencing despair because of something. There's something going on that has made your brain do that. They've just actually published landmark studies talking about the SSRI interpretation of why your brain does that in terms of, oh, it's just a chemical imbalance. You're just like this. No, there's always something causing this, except in very rare instances. But in terms of the average person who's experiencing depression, your brain is warning you about something. 
Go to church, confess your sins, get with the boys, cuddle if you have to. <laughs> I don't know. It's not gay. They want you to think it's gay. It's, they want, as long as you say no homo, it's not gay. You're gay. Real. They want you to think there's a binary. It's more nuanced than that. So we can all agree that we go gym? We do go gym. We do a little go gym. All right, John, my question is a little bit off topic, but pretty good, I think. Can you describe to us the dream in which Jake Paul incepted the white boy summer checklist into your mind? Well, first of all, Jake Paul is white excellence. I'm tired of pretending he's not. You know, you look at guys like Jake Paul, guys like Tom Brady, people just get mad at them because they're like basically confident in themselves. And these guys, you know, Jake Paul in particular, he'll be asked a question like, don't you think it was like racist that you knocked out this like black boxer? And he's like 95 IQ, so he's like, no, 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 I don't know, no, it's just a fight. He's so willing to dismiss that, but uh, I don't know. I mean, he is white boy summer. And, you know, the whole idea with white boy summer as a meme is actually reflecting the fact that white guys, even if they won't acknowledge it to the extent that I will, are sick of being told that we're like these bozos who aren't good at anything and we need people who are, you know, better educated than us, uh, you know, from more vibrant cultures than us to come through and, like, take the reins of what is, frankly, the greatest civilization that's ever been built from European men, fact. And uh, I think that if we can cope with that by kind of pretending that, like, we get our own summer, that's going to be very positive for us. And if Jake Paul's the ambassador, I'll be Jake Paul's top guy. I don't care. He's a, he's a great guy. Thank you. Yeah, hi. My question is for Hunter. Um, you talk a lot about uh, the societal impacts, enforcement of these stereotypes, but I'm curious if you can name a substantive um, way that that enforcement mechanism is engaged, because I can name plenty of ways that it's engaged in the opposite direction. I mean, we can look at the characterization of adult fathers, white men primarily, on cartoon television. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can get more than just saying society, joker, ha, 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 but actually get to the details and, and kind of give a recent example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, great example is like what I mentioned before about the study where they found that even having something as subtle as a picture of a man as the scientist in the textbook can have these subconscious biases that can sort of be reinforced. So. Um, yeah, I think that there are more subtle examples, and I think that that's why it's a lot more challenging to point to sometimes, is because it's easy to say, like, look, here's some dumbass online that said this, that, and the other thing, but there are also strong pushes still for these traditional norms from people like John, from other people who are high profile, have large audiences, and so I think that a lot of it just comes from a lot more of a subtle reinforcement, and I think the study that demonstrated how women are less likely to do as well in math and science, if the picture in front of them is that a man is the scientist or the, the mathematician, uh, is a pretty good indicator of that. What does it say about sex differences where like women will be so dissuaded by a photograph that they'll be like, I don't want to do this anymore. Men will just be like, sick, the scientist is a chick. Maybe I get to, and you know, the male brain will do what it will. Um, there, again, there have been studies on this sort of stereotype harm that have found that women are not, in fact, actually dissuaded. I'm assuming the study that he's referring to maybe is the big recent review from 2021 where they found that the study that was claiming this was the most uh, prevalence was actually fabricating their numbers. So, no, no it's that not was true. not the And one you know what? Why would you say that about women, that they are so sensitive and coddled that one photo would just dissuade them from pursuing what is so obviously excellence? What is, they can see the horizon. They can build America back better, better than we even had it. We're stupid white men. And they would be off put by that because of a photograph, they're not, not that, that fragile. It's not that they're off put, it's that there are subconscious biases that can be reinforced. And I think that a lot of us underestimate the power that subconscious ideals can play in decision making in the future. Real American patriot. Do you want to come up Let's and ask go. a question? So, uh, John, earlier you mentioned that, uh, you know, fitness is a great example of, uh, you know, uh, male uh, gender, gender role. Can you just give us one for the boys? Uh, why is fitness so important? You know, give us some, give us some motivation. It's cool. I mean, I would like to tell you that, like, you know, oh, if your OHP is this percent of your body weight, then your t confidence is going up. It's cool. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do as a man. I forget who said this, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but those of us who lift are maybe familiar. What a tragedy it would be for a man to die and not see what his body could achieve in its highest form of potential, if you will. I mean, why would you not want to look like that? Why would you not want to be like that? And that's, of course, why there's no equivalent to, you're all familiar with the, uh, what is it? 
Whoa, no, the Chad, the Giga Chad, right. <laughs> there will never be an equivalent of the Giga Chad for women. There just won't be because men will look at someone who is literally like comically in shape and be like, I need to do that. I need to be better. Women will look at a bikini model that's like starved herself for months and be like, this is not nice. I cannot do this. And so we're more competitive in the sense that we want to aspire to that. And women, they're more just like, well, I'm the best and everyone else needs to kind of get away. So I think it's incredibly important. It's important for your confidence. It makes you more confident, uh, which as a man, I mean, if you have confidence, you can do anything. They always say that you can do anything you put your mind to. No, you can't. You have to be confident in that you can do that. That's what they mean by putting your mind to it. You have to be confident. You can't just be like, I think I could do this. You have have to know it, right? And, and in order to do that, I think you need to uh, work out. No, one, no one's going to take you seriously also. I mean, Chris Christie, great politician. <laughs> no one takes him seriously. There's something about physiognomy that's very real. And uh, as much as we might like to think otherwise, it's just it's the case. So you want to look your best. You want to dress nice, well-groomed, but also be in shape. Look like you could handle your own. People will respect you more for it. Just to weigh in very quickly, I agree a lot with what you have said there, John, as far as how important it is to exercise and confidence and whatnot. But I think this is also a good example of something that doesn't need to be gendered. Now, of course, if you're a male and you have testosterone, the ability to exercise is going to result in more muscle accumulation and whatnot. Again, biology is real. I never said otherwise. Um, however, working out and exercising is beneficial for everybody's mental well-being, everybody's confidence. And so I don't think this is necessarily something that needs to be for the men to do. I think that everybody should aspire to live healthier lives. Um, this is just a comment, but thank you to both of you for just um, for the time I to come out here. Um, I'm with the Georgia State Turning Point, um, and with the two guys over there with the MAGA hats, and um, they're big fans. By the way, John, John Doyle, they're really big. We're really big fans of you. Like, we drove three hours all the way from Atlanta to Let's get go. here, wow. like three hours long. So, thank you. I don't know if you have like a schedule, like if it's like not too packed. If you have time, like sometime next semester, would you be open to just coming out to our campus if you're open yeah. to uh, campus speaking on campuses and stuff? Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, I, just send me an email. It's uh, available on my YouTube. In terms of that, can we get the three gentlemen, or three? Yes. Can we get the three gentlemen who drove all this way to come to the dinner with us? Yes, Can we please. do that? Let's yes. go. We love can we? Peach. Yes. Definitely. Let's go. Definitely. Everything. Let's yes. go. I really appreciate that. That means a lot. See, well, this is the problem. You, you give them an inch, and then... So wait, am I just not invited then, or...? No, totally. No, 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 please. What's the deal? No, we love a picture with you, too. Hunter, Look, we, we love, love Hunter. I mean, I, the first thing I said to this guy is like, dude, I'm a fan. I remember watching Hunter Avalon in 2016. It was the glory days. You know, Doc Hudson, Hunter Avalon, running circles around the SJWs. Now, not so much. But we have a lot of respect for Hunter. I still like to run the circles around the SJWs, all right? Not every liberal-leaning person is an SJW. <laughs> now I am going to cry, so. Thank you everybody for great questions. Let's give everybody a round of applause. <laughs> and I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Let's thank our debaters, uh, the UTK exec board here at Uncensored America at University of Tennessee has been fantastic. It really means a lot because a lot of people, I'd say it, but it's hard doing this. It's very hard. A lot of people face a lot of intimidation, a lot of pushback from their friends, family even, or coworkers. And to come out and do this and to put the work in is amazing. So let's just give a big round of applause to everybody who's volunteered and who's on the board of Uncensored America. And most of this room here are paid ticket holders, and we've had people donating online. So I'd love to give a big thank you to everybody who's paid, because we literally can't do this without you guys. It means a lot. And being able to host this in the Knoxville Convention Center was a great new experience. We're mostly doing stuff on campus or in traditional sort of classroom. And UTK wanted to put us in this lab that was like a glorified chem lab, and it just wasn't good optics. So I think this was pretty good optics. What do we think? Was this pretty good? Yeah. And I'd also like to thank Superset Media for designing our motion graphics. I met with them a few months ago, and they've been doing amazing work with us. 
and I'm so happy that we got to work with them with everything. And our camera crew that we have has been amazing as well. I'm not going to dox anybody, but say they've been amazing. And I love, really couldn't do this without these people. I really love all the work everybody's putting in. Um, because a lot of times when you try to find help for these things, it can be very difficult. But people were just stepping right up to the plate and wanted to help. So it's really meaningful and really great. And I'd also like to thank the advisor for the club here. Uh, he's in attendance, and he decided to support us uh, back when we were starting this club about two years ago, I think it was, or a year and a half ago. And that means a lot as well to us. It's very great they stepped up to the plate. And we can't go without thanking the Progressive Student Alliance. I don't know if you guys seen, but they wrote this massive disavow where they condemned us and said, you can't debate gender roles. And they had a protest out there. I don't know if you guys saw it, but they were putting signs up against the glass and didn't really accomplish much, but it was funny. <laughs> But hey, we all support protests, so it's great. And we thank them for disavowing us, and even wrote a fanfic, which was kind of weird, but we won't talk about that. And I'd also like to thank all the friends who have supported us throughout this journey, because like I said, we started at Penn State, we started a chapter at University of Tennessee, now we have one at the University of Wisconsin, and we have ones, I won't reveal where they're gonna start yet, but they're gonna be at three big campuses uh, across the country, and if you have any friends that are involved those, you probably know, but it's really great seeing that this thing is blowing up bigger and bigger. We have people driving three hours come out to this. I mean, that's amazing. We had people, 12? 12? Wow. Amazing. Um, <laughs> but that's wonderful. Because even at Penn State, even though the event got canceled, we had people come from New York, Arkansas, all over the country that were coming to see that and help us out. So really, it's great to see that people are coming together to support free speech and actually fight. Uh, on the battlefront, whereas a lot of people just like to be online and tweet things. These people are actually coming out here like you guys to support us and to contribute to the cause. So it's really great. And if you want to follow John or Hunter, you can do so on Instagram, YouTube. That's usually the best places to reach them because they're probably banned on pretty much everything else. John, you can reach at, at johndoyle.jpg on Instagram and on youtube.com slash johndoyle. For Hunter, you can go to Instagram and at Hunter Avalon. He also has a link tree there we can follow everything else for him. And on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Hunter Avalon. So give all those guys a follow and keep the conversation going afterwards. And if you'd like to follow us on any new adventures we partake in or any new chapters we start, new events, you can go to uncensoredamerica.us to see all of our, well, we're banned on Instagram now, I can't mention that, and we're banned on Facebook. Uh, they got my personal account after the Gavin event. So you can really only follow us on Telegram, email list, and YouTube. I'm surprised we still have the YouTube left, but it's probably going to be gone after tonight. But who cares? We need to fight for free speech. We need to push uh, no matter where the battlefront is. So if you can follow us there, if you can start a chapter, that's the place to do it. And if you are a backstage or royalty ticket holder, please stay. We're going to do the meet and greet, and then we'll head on out. So thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. You've all been amazing. I hope you had a great time. Thank you.